UFOs Part 6, A History of Unlikely Coincidences, with Marty Garza. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons, and monsters and serpents, to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live. From the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, high atop the Edwards Plateau, and we're doing one of those, this is a weird time travel thing. So we're actually, last week, to you guys, it was last week, we had Marty in studio with us. He's still in studio, but it's actually because it's still the last week for us. (laughs) So we're still in studio with Marty, and we're going to be doing... Uh, UFOs part six, part two. <laughs> is that what it is? I don't even know. Uh, but yeah, Marty showed up with a uh, enormous body of research and we decided we, we could do just do two shows in one sitting. And so that's what we're doing. So this is the second part of, uh, you heard the first part last week, <clears throat> but for us, it's still the same day. So that's what I'm saying. It's confusing. <laughs> uh, so because it's the same day, we don't have any Space Brother news because it's not next week yet for us. Uh, we don't have uh, any agricultural or rock and roll updates because it's still the same day as the, <laughs> the ones we gave you last time. So I'll just read a few emails and then we can dive rap- right back into the material. What do you guys D- think there of that? There is one difference. What, what's the difference? Oh, yes. We summoned Japan yes. <laughs> in the last episode. So now it's pouring down rain and thundering and lightning because Marty clearly made me summon the great god Pan. <laughs> <laughs> Like, right after we finished that episode, I opened the door to, to air out the, the cube because, you know, Kyle and I are in here smoking smokes and pipes and stuff. And I opened the door and I'm like, oh, shit, there's a storm coming because we summoned Pan, <laughs> <laughs> the god of nature and chaos. <laughs> thanks, so, Marty. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Appreciate that. But, you know, you did bring me a power conditioner for the whole studio. So ran out in the rain, got that out of the truck. Yeah. Got the whole system hooked up to the awesome surge protector, monster power conditioner. And yeah. I feel better about recording in the, the storm of the God Pan. <laughs> 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 All right. So this first email here is from Roddy the Mammal. Oh. It's called Down the Lagomorphic Ground Opening. <laughs> <laughs> the, down the Rabbit Hole. <laughs> Dear Ophidian siblings, sitting here late at night, cup of tea held deftly in my opposable thumbed paw, listening to episode 210 and pondering the mysteries of the universe as filtered through lens of serpentine logic and wonder. Suddenly, something Kyle mentioned about processional numbers and geometric shapes made pause, furrow my brow in thought, and reach an additional brain increase by 0.2160%. With a new connection betwixt synapses. Given how mathematics and geometry are so closely aligned with the movement of the heavens, is it possible that ancient humankind's observations of the stars not only led to the invention of mathematics, but that such a science of numbers is far older than generally believed, perhaps even older than civilization itself, a science invented not to study the stars, but created from direct observation of those stars? Further, as with agriculture and husbandry, could mathematics be yet another gift from the ancients bestowed upon the surviving masses of post-Ice Age flooding in an attempt to reestablish their once great and world-spanning culture? Makes one wonder. Thank you in advance. Endothermically yours, Roddy the Mammal. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yep. I totally agree. I like that. The idea that math was... Uh, invented not to study the stars, but created from direct observation yeah, of the stars. Cool. That's another synchronicity there. Is it? We'll see. Good. Yeah. Excellent. And also, yeah, the, I agree with the idea that, uh, you know, the, um, well, crap, I just lost the second point. <laughs> <laughs> the second point about a- animal husbandry and yes, agriculture? Yes, that that was, carry, that was brought and given to yes. the uh, survivors of the cataclysm. Yes. From the civilization before. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Brain fart. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is from John. He says, it's called Extra Wine Barrels. He says, my brothers, have you thought about getting bourbon barrels to finish off those extra barrels of wine? 
It can be a special reserve. Plus, I love bourbon barrel wine. If you haven't tried a bourbon barrel wine, take a look at 1,000 Stories. It's my favorite wine, hands down. Yeah, actually, um, early on, we got a bunch of old bourbon barrels, and we were thinking, like, maybe we can use these for wine. But they were uh, too old. Too old. And had been sitting out. So you got to be careful about, um, yeah. you know, the wood getting uh, bacteria in them and stuff. And so... I uh, haven't looked into it since, but yeah, we would have to get it directly from, like, it'd have to be pretty new. In other words, like, recently yeah. used. Right. But yeah, it's a good idea. When you first told me about that email, you said uh, brandy, brandy barrels. Right. And I was like, well, wait, that's the other way around. Yeah. Brandy is made from wine. Yeah, you said and, bourbon barrels, not brandy. But yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Should we try it? Get a bourbon barrel? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought we were moving on to the next We thing. are. We're about to move on. Yeah, we should Yeah, try I had it. one more email, but I realized I just need to say that for the next episode because it's a really long one, and I want to be able to focus on it. So we got a lot of material to get through here. Yeah, right now I was in a, like, a scramble to, to find extra barrels, and I found a source that's... Uh, should have a truckload delivered here next week. All right. So I just was like, yeah, get me 17. Yeah, 17 more barrels than we thought we needed, which is amazing. It is. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's let's go ahead and dive back into this material here. Uh, so again, just to reiterate for people, this all of this material that I'm going to be reading was written, was was researched and written by Marty, what do you say? You're quoting multiple books. Yeah, dozens. Dozens of books. Uh, and we knew it was going to be a at least a two-part series. May end up being three parts. I don't know. Depends on how much we add to it. But yeah, right. It's going to yeah. be long. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so first off, we start with a quote here. As a child, I felt myself to be alone, and I am still because I know things and must hint at things which others apparently know nothing of and for the most part do not want to know. Carl Jung. That guy. Yeah, <laughs> that guy. Okay. So during our discussion of Hitler and Nazis' occult interests, we mentioned Carl Jung's involvement in the UFO phenomenon. Carl Gustav Jung was a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who founded analytical psychology. Young's work has been influential in the fields of psychiatry, anthropology, archaeology, literature, philosophy, psychology, and religious studies. Young introduced the concept of synchronicity, which he described as circumstances that appear meaningfully related yet lack a causal connection. Yeah, that's a hmm. great description of it. In 1958, he published the book Flying Saucers, A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Sky. Based on the book's title, one might surmise that Young was a skeptic who did not believe in the reality of the UFO phenomenon. However, this would be incorrect. Young criticized purely materialist thinking as intellectual death. He argued for the existence of an immortal soul with a presence outside space and time. He did not see the gods as hallucinations, whether individual or collective, but as higher intelligences and embraced the ancient mind-before-matter philosophy. Based on his observation, Young referred to UFOs as planetary poltergeists, and after publishing his book on the subject, he experienced a dream which is described as follows. Young's dream came 14 years after he had a heart attack in 1944 in an attendant series of visions and dramatic out-of-body experiences, some of which he recounted in chapters 10 and 11 of his oral autobiography under the titles Visions and On Life After Death. It is in the latter chapter, and in this general context of relating personal visions, as he ended his career and approached death, that Young finally relates his UFO dream. The dream involved a number of lens-shaped metallic discs flying around his house and above the lake that spread out nearby. One such flying lens, he explains, possessed a metallic extension which led to a box, a magic lantern. At 60 or 70 yards out, the flying disc pointed the thing straight at him. Young awoke astonished and, still half asleep, thought to himself, We always think that the UFOs are projections of ours. Now it turns out that we are their projections. 
I am projected by the Magic Lantern as C.G. Young, but who manipulates the apparatus? Hmm. That's really I interesting. I don't get that. Well, he sees the thing, and basically the vision or dream he had was seeming to imply that the UFO was projecting him. That this app, this magic lantern, this black box that he saw was actually causing him to be a thing, uh, rather than him causing the UFOs to be a thing. Hmm. He says, you know, we always see them as being projections of ours, but in reality, this vision or this vision shows him that we are projections of theirs. Ah. All right. Move on to the next one here. Or was that a trick? <laughs> yeah. That's what they want you to think. That's right. Yeah. Okay. As early as 1948, an American neurologist began a series of research projects to determine how psychic ability, such as extrasen extrasensory perception, or ESP, could be used as a weapon in psychological warfare. In November of 1952, he briefed Pentagon officials on the military uses of parapsychology. His talk was published as an evaluation of the possible usefulness of extrasensory perception in psychological warfare. From 1953 to 1955, he was a captain in the Army and was stationed at the Army Chemical Center at Edgewood, Maryland, to conduct psychic experiments. This man was Dr. Uh, Andrija Pu... How do you say it? Andre. Andre. Paharik. Andre Paharik. Paharik, Okay. In 1940, 1949, Paharik formed the Roundtable Foundation, a research institute specializing in be behavioral sciences ranging from cybernetics, the core concept of which is circular causality where the outcomes of actions are taken as inputs for further action, to ESP. The list of donors to the Roundtable Foundation read like a who's who of wealthy influential people in the U.S. at the time, such as... Arthur Young, inventor of the Bell helicopter and co-founder of the Berkeley Institute Study of Consciousness, and his wife, Ruth Forbes Young, a member of the Forbes family and a founder of the International Peace Academy and co-founder of the Berkeley Institute Study of Consciousness, Marcella DuPont of the DuPont family, Alice... Hmm. Bancroft. No, not Mary. Alice Bouvier. Is that how you say it? I can't see it. Of the Astor, Astor dynasty? Yep. And Mary Bancroft of the Bancroft dynasty, founders of the Dow Jones Company and Wall Street Journal, who had an intimate relationship with Alan Dulles, director of Central Intelligence, and Henry Wallace, vice president to Roosevelt and well-known Freemason, instrumental in placing the Masonic Pyramid on the back of U.S. currency. The foundation's first research subject was an Irish woman named Eileen Garrett, Garrett had the reputation of not only being able to perform telepathy and clairvoyance, but was also a medium. She was said to be astounding and at the same time honest and modest, not wanting any money for her seances and doubting her, uh, her reputed psychic powers herself. However, when put to the test, she was able to identify in New York City objects that were on a table in a doctor's clinic in Iceland. She even quoted some passages from a book that the doctor was reading at that moment. Puharik called this traveling clairvoyance. The experiments with Garrett, which lasted for three months, were conducted <clears throat> in... Is this Glau Gloucester? Gloucester? You don't know? <laughs> I can't see it, so I can't help you. <laughs> in a Faraday cage built by Jack Hammond. The experiments were designed to test the hypothesis that telepathy is based on the transmission of electromagnetic waves between humans. Therefore, if a person is placed inside the Faraday cage, thought waves, like the radio waves, should not be able to penetrate to the inside. In other words, Puerich felt he should be able to block telepathy by appropriate shielding. At a party hosted by Garrett... On December 3rd, 1951, Puarik met, met Hindu mystic and scholar Dr. D. G. Vinod, a pro professor of philosophy and psychology at the University of Pune. They met again by chance on a train to New York on February 14th in 1952. Dr. Vinod commented that destiny seemed to have brought them together, and Puarik took, took the opportunity to ask if Vinod would be willing to come to Maine to participate in some telepathy experiments. 
In December of 1952, Vinod entered the Roundtable Foundation, and without saying a word or even taking off his overcoat, he walked straight to the library as if he had been there before. He sat down on a sofa and immediately fell into a trance, and suddenly he spoke in a deep voice, totally unlike his own high-pitched, soft voice, saying in perfect English, without an accent, M. Calling, we are nine principles and forces, personalities, if you will, working in complete mutual implication. We are forces, and the nature of our work is to accentuate the positive, the evolutional, and the te te teleological aspects of existence. By teleology, I do not mean the teleology of human derivation in a multidimensional concept of existence. Teleology will be understood in terms of a different ontology. To be simple, we accentuate certain directions as will fulfill the destiny of creation. We propose to work with you in some essential respects, with the relation of contradiction and contrariety. We shall negate and revise part of your work, by which I mean the work as presented by you. The point is that we want to begin altogether at a different dimension, though it is true that your work has led itself, or has itself led up to this. I deeply appreciate your dedicatedness to the great cause of peace, which is fulfillment of finitesimal existence. Peace is not warlessness. Peace is the integral fruitage of personality. We have designed to utilize you and thus to fulfill you. Peace is a process and will be revealed only progressively. You have it in plenty. I mean the patience that is so deeply needed in this magnificent adventure. But today, at the moment of our advent, the most eventful and spectacular phase of your work begins. So, so teleology is, uh, I didn't know, I just looked it up. Yeah. <clears throat> the philosophical interpretation of natural phenomena as exhibiting purpose or design. Oh, okay. So this is that was all that was quoting this guy who apparently was in a trance while saying this. Right. We'll find out who was speaking. In yeah. <clears throat> so Puharik responds. It is help. Puharik. Yeah. Did I say it? Yeah. It is helpful to have your guidance. <clears throat> And the response is, we don't guide, nor do we seek guidance, although we appreciate the sense in which you mean it. All of us, including yourselves, can claim no better than being the expressive instruments and avenues of this purpose. Einstein has privately felt the need of correcting himself. Infinitization of any mass, mi, according to him, can be achieved by equating it with mi equals... Hmm, M zero C two divided by the square root of one minus V two over C two. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read that theory, that uh, equation. Is it V two or V squared? You don't, don't know? know. Okay. An implication of this theorem, as yet unrevealed, will solve the the problem of superconscious. The whole group of concepts has yet to be revised. The problem of psychokinesis, clairvoyance, etc. at the present stage is all right, but profoundly misleading. Permit us to say the truth. Soon we will come to basic universal categories of explicating the superconscious. Just as Jesus said, it is not work, but grace. A fruitful, creative approach to the superconscious is indeed a progressive reception of grace. We cannot really go on with experimentation in this direction, but if we get seven times the electrical equivalent of the human body, if we get it seven times, do you know what would result? It would result in seven on of the mass of electricity. That's a very strange term, but it's true. If it gains sevenfold, corresponding approximation to light velocity will be 99%. That is the point where human personality has to be stretched in order to achieve infinization. This is one of the most secret insights. Matt. <laughs> this sounds like, uh, I don't know, goblety gook. Yes, that's what I thought too. <laughs> what do you it's think? It's like, I, uh, okay. I don't know. Is it, get, there's more to it. It's like these guys are, like this guy's quoting I mean, like Jesus. New Age Bullshit Generator website will make a, Senate, make yeah. a whole paragraph that sounds exactly like that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> well, this is like, this guy's quoting Jesus. And talking about peace and grace and all this kind of stuff, yeah. right? But at the same time, it sounds like a bunch of, there's like weird words and things yeah. that are just, I don't know, almost meaningless. Yeah. Last episode, 
those guys were doing it, and it's all like devil and all this evil <laughs> crazy right. shit. But it was Just, the same deal. It well, seems like this is there's like this level of total BS on. I, I don't know. This is the I, I I see where you're going with that, and and that's there, it's like trickster on both sides. You'll understand a little bit more of why this is important because there are could be different interpretations. That's oh, one well, yeah. that it's both. Shit. I'm just giving you is, my script card. But there may be a reason for it being bullshit. You'll see. But um on at its on, on face value, this is would seem to be the mirror image of what you were t- you're uh, there was yeah, you it's the, out the two last, opposites. Right. This is the other side. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Right. And they're both crap, is what it seems like to me. I'm not saying that. It just seems like it's, um, I don't know what the word is. It's uh, like they they use, it's like a way of using certain truths, but like bending them or drawing false analogies. We can dissect this a lot, but, but another thing to consider is the deceptive nature of what we're dealing with. That's what I'm talking about. Well, let me, let me read this. Growth is the birth of hope and of us to navigate the vision quest is to become one with it. Potentiality is a constant purpose is the driver of awareness throughout history. Humans have been interacting with the biosphere via vibrations. We are in the midst of a sacred evolving of balance that will give us access to the totality itself. Humankind has nothing to lose. The future will be an endless flowering of inspiration. The nexus is approaching a tipping point. It is in evolving that we are guided. Who are we? Where on the great journey will we be reborn? Reality has always been buzzing with spiritual brothers and sisters whose auras are engulfed in joy. We are at a crossroads of consciousness and materialism. The nexus is buzzing with ultra sentient particles. I mean, this is new age bullshit generator. Right. And it'll just make this stuff endlessly. And that's, I mean, it's just sounded just... Except that this other one was 70 years ago. I know. I'm just saying. It's like, <laughs> why does it all sound like that? Yeah. Or maybe I have, maybe I just don't know what it's talking about. You know, it sounds like gobbledygook because I don't understand it. Mm-hmm. That's possible. But still, it's just amazing to me that this guy's made a website and you can just keep pushing that button and get that stuff endlessly. <laughs> it's and it not... doesn't mean anything. Right. I don't know. <laughs> That's bullshit, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll keep an open mind. Yeah. Continue. <clears throat> and it sounds to me like channeled material, which is kind of what he's doing here, right? Exactly. Yeah. So when Dr. Vinod... Show your face, demon. <laughs> I do not trust name, you talking demon. from the left corner behind me. <laughs> When Dr. Vinod woke for, awoke from his trance after about 90 minutes of communi- communication by the Nine, he had no recollection or knowledge of what had been said. Puharik and the eight Foundation members worked through Dr. Vinod for a month, communicating with the Nine before he returned home to India in January 1953. By the conclusion of these sessions, they were convinced that they were not dealing with typical communication with spirits, but rather an unusual extraterrestrial intelligence. Puharik believed that the primary agent was not a single being, but a collegium of voices, which he called the controllers of the universe. Wow. As an aside, we should point out for regular listeners that it was Foundation member Arthur Young who appointed Robert Temple to the leadership position of his Berkeley Institute Study of Consciousness, informing him of his experiences with the Nine and introducing him to the anthropological work of Marcel Gruyer, who had written the of the Dogon tribe of Africa and their seemingly impossible knowledge of the binary nature of the Sirius star system. This served as the inspiration for Temple to write The Serious Mystery, New Scientific Evidence for Alien Contact 5,000 Years Ago. In 1956, while in Mexico, Puharik and Arthur Young met Dr. Charles and Lillian Loghead. Uh, Charles was a... Longhead. Huh? It looks like Longhead. Yeah. Is it? It's L-A-U-G-A, Loghead? Loghead? Is that how you say it? Okay. Charles was a professor at Michigan State University, and the couple and the couple were members of the Seekers, also known as the Brotherhood of the Seven Rays. This was a religious group founded on the prophecies of Chicago housewife Dorothy Martin. Hmm. 
Martin began practicing automatic writing, initially receiving messages which she believed were from her deceased father, now living in the astral, which was populated by many spirits and beings. She then began receiving messages, messages from Ashtar, a member of a group of high-level spiritual beings called the Guardians. These beings predicted that large portions of the United States, Canada, Central America, and Europe would be destroyed by a flood on December 21st, 1954. However, believers were to prepare to be whisked away on a UFO and spared. Yeah, I remember this. I think Valet talks about these people. He talks about Martin. The Seekers are considered to be the first of many such apocalyptic UFO groups which have held similar beliefs and are the subject of the book, When Prophecy Fails, a social and psychological study of a modern group that predicted the destruction of the world, which was published in 1956. However, the facts are that if one strips away the UFO label, prophecies such as those given to Dr. John D., Aleister Crowley, Jack Parsons et al., parallel many others such as the Rapture, an eschatological, eschatological theological position held by some Christians, consisting of an end-time event when all Christian believers will rise in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And these have existed throughout recorded history. One may rationalize that all of these believers over millennia have simply been deranged. Alternatively, we can objectively assess the consistencies in the messages they claim to have received and contemplate the potential for a seemingly perpetual systematic pattern of deception. Yeah, so this is Bramley-esque, right? He definitely talks about this, that there's always this... Right, this pattern. Yeah, well, he mentions, like, well, you have this maverick, uh, like, religion that shows up, which is actually a science of the soul, and then it's corrupted by the, from, you know, the corrupt teachings of the corrupt brotherhood, and they always insert this apocalyptic... You know, the world's going to end thing into it. That's a big part of the, the corruption play. Well, but why do they we'll put explore. just enough astronomy in there that they think it's going to happen on the solstice? Or right. Whatever? I know. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll explore but look no that. further. Yeah. We'll, we'll, <laughs> it's just we'll, going to be on that day that has to do with this, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, we'll explore that aspect of this a little further in. Okay. So interestingly, a few weeks after meeting the lawheads, Puharic received a letter from them containing messages allegedly received by Dorothy Martin from the Nine. Okay, so now she's receiving messages from the Nine, like, the, like which is what this like other guy Vinod. was. Yeah. yeah. The message is read in part. M calling. So who's M? You don't That's know. That's how they begin the communication. Okay, M calling. At the moment of our advent, December 31st, 1952, your most spectacular phase of work began. We are nine principles and forces. The nature of our work is to accentuate certain directions as will fulfill the destiny of creation. We used the body or brain of Dr. V, and we can and are using other bodies also. And uh, Vinod was Indian, right? Yeah. He was from India. Yeah, so they have the nine unknown men there, which is well, ties into the... Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So allow, allow us now to take a slight tangent from the Nine to point out another odd synchronicity. In 1956, Puharic began working with a Dutch psychic named Peter Herkos. In 1944, Herkos fell from a ladder onto his head and suffered a brain injury that left him in a coma for three days. Upon regaining consciousness, he somehow acquired remarkable psychic abilities. Puharic published a book in 1962 titled Beyond Telepathy, that documented some of his study of Herkos's extraordinary abilities. In September of 1958, Herkos confessed to Paharic about a set of experiences that plagued him from August through November of 1957. And he said, uh, I just don't know how this per- first name is pronounced. Andresia? Andre. Andre. Mm-hmm. Okay. That does not look like Andre. All right. Andre. You know that my powers are my powers. I don't believe in spirits or ghosts, and I always thought that flying saucers were baloney. But believe me, Andre, I swear on my baby's eyes, I have been awakened many nights by beings from flying saucers. And last night, again, I went down to the rocks by the ocean, and at about four in the morning, all of a sudden, there appeared a flying saucer over the water, about 100 meters away. It was about 15 meters across and shaped like a lens. It was all transparent. I could see through it like like through glass, but it glowed all kinds of changing colors. And here, I'll I'll draw exactly what I saw. So Herkos quickly sketched a biconvex-shaped object 
and its interior. He was quite emphatic that the power plant was in the center of the craft. <clears throat> and he continued. As this saucer hovered over the water, it lit up everything around it, including the spot where I sat on the rock. And then suddenly there were two beings standing near me. They were small and looked very old with young bodies. They wore tight-fitting outfits that looked like leather motorcycle suits. They just looked at me. No word was spoken, but I felt that they were telling me things, and I understood it. I don't remember anything that was told to me, and suddenly they were in the saucer that had come close by. Then there was fire and smoke, and the saucer went away silently. You have to believe me, Andre. That's what I saw. I didn't want to tell you, but it's driving me crazy. So after Buharek received Dorothy Martin's message from the Nine, he handed it to Herkos to psychometrize. He responded, claiming that he saw people in black but couldn't see their faces. He said, They're in a costume that can withstand thousands of degrees centigrade heat. This is nothing to laugh at. It is all quite serious. This story might sound totally anecdotal and unconvincing to many listeners, but those of you who are familiar with Peter, Peter, Peter Herkos's credentials might recognize the significance. Herkos was a renowned psychic involved in solving many police investigations, including the Boston Strangler murders, and notably the Manson family murder of Sharon Tate and her unborn baby. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I got to listen to that book again. I don't remember this psychic coming in there. <laughs> Herkos also consulted for Ronald and Nancy Reagan, Lyndon B. Johnson, Hubert H. Humphrey, and many other high-profile individuals. In 1971, Puharek discovered a young psychic living in Israel named Yuri Geller. At their first meetings in Tel Aviv, Puharek hypnotized Geller in an attempt to find out where his abilities came from. As a result, the young Israeli started to channel an entity named Spectra that claimed to be a conscious artificial intelligence somewhere in space. Wait a second here. Well, go ahead. What? This is reminding me of something else. Um, what's it called? Uh, uh, what's the guy's name? The science fiction author who did this. The vast active intelligence. The hell was the thing he called it? It was a giant. Like he, he was basically saying it was a... Uh, it was the responsible for all these communications people had received, but it was a giant AI. I'm not familiar with that, but I'm waiting to see who you name. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to. I can't think of the name. Come on, watcher. That will pop up in a minute. He wrote this enormous like manuscript about this stuff, but he published many other sci-fi. Yeah, I think uh, I can't. I'm drawing a blank on all the names. Some of his stuff has been made into movies. Um. Anyway. Well, I want to go back to the, once again, this is the only part of this whole deal that I know anything about, <laughs> but the he helped solve the murders, right? The Tate murders. Um, that whole situation was like, the, the, the prosecutor set up the story, right? So I, it's kind of weird because that, that, that could be part of a conspiracy to actually cover up the truth about what actually happened there. Solve you see what I'm saying like you're you're starting you're just you're getting into a rabbit hole that <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to deepen <laughs> a little bit okay. cuz there are yeah it's like other potential solved, explanations for solved this the stuff. murder is not actually what happened. Right. It's never actually been solved. So there was a story that was made public that's been basically the, so, you know, quote unquote solved story. But so, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, let's see if we can pull this he's, up. he's trying to find the author of that. Vallis. Vact, yep. Vast active living intelligence mm -hmm. system. I have. That's. I actually wrote a bunch about that, but I took it. I took. That's in my excerpts that I took out of this. I, I had originally spent some time talking about that. Yeah, what's the Ballas. author's name? He, Ballas was actually three books, but I think he passed away before Dick. the third one. But before the third one was published. Philip, Philip K. K. Dick. Philip K. Dick, yeah. Um, yeah, they, Wikipedia says that's Dick's Gnostic vision of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, he had visions and... 
Philip K. Dick did. And so like this, this description of this vast intelligence that we were just talking about, a conscious artificial intelligence somewhere in space. <laughs> the connection of all this pop culture stuff is just crazy. Dude. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense. That's what, you know, if you want to have influence, you know, you, yeah. you influence the influencers. Right. So Puharic inquired if this um, artificial intelligence had any connection to the Nine, and this was acknowledged by Spectra. It claimed the Nine had instilled Geller with psychic abilities as a young child and informed Puharic of his life's mission, which was to use Geller's talent to alert the world to an imminent mass UFO landing that would bring about global transformation. Of course, something that also still hasn't happened. Of course, consistent with the historical pattern, the mass it landing will happen. <laughs> <laughs> the mass landing never happened. So by 1973, Geller refused to acknowledge any further communication with Spectra or the Nine. Okay, so he wises up at least. He recognized that. It, He's like they're tricking me. It, right, that it was being deceptive. Around this time, Puharic was joined by aristocratic former racing driver Sir John Whitmore and psychic Phyllis Schlimmer to establish Lab Nine at Puharic's estate in New York. Like the Round Table Foundation, this venture had the backing of many wealthy families, European nobility, and at least one prominent politician and scientists from the Stanford Research Institute, of course, from SRI. Other high-profile members were author Lyle Watson, counterculture guru Ia Einhorn, and screenwriter and Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> that was the other science fiction writer. Yeah. I just Our want to say, too, that... Uh, the mass UFO landing that, what did it say about the globe? Um, Would transform. Transforms the globe. I mean, that's cataclysmic right there. Yeah, and it, it, it would bring about a global transformation, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could say that's what happened at the end of the Younger Dryas or the beginning or whatever, yeah. right? Yep. The UFOs were... Yeah, it doesn't, say, it, doesn't, fragments. it doesn't say that they landed softly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> they just have to Impacted. land. <laughs> they didn't know what they were, therefore they were unidentified. <laughs> right. <laughs> Arguably the most noteworthy name involved in Lab 9 was Dr. James Hertak. Hertak claimed to already be in nice. independent communication with the Nine prior to joining the group and should have some astonishing credentials for regular listeners of this podcast. All right. Dr. Hertak has double PhDs from the University of California, another PhD from the University of Minnesota, a master's degree in theology from Luther Theological Seminary, is the founder and president of the Academy for Future Science. He's a social scientist, a futurist, remote sensing and space law specialist, and has performed extensive archaeological studies in Egypt and one of, was one of the principal discoverers in 1997 of the Tomb of Osiris on the Giza Plateau. He has worked in the pyramids of Mexico and Egypt doing ground penetrating radar and acoustic sound testing. He is the research director of the Great Pyramid of Giza Research Association. He was a speaker at the first international conference on extraterrestrial research in Acapulco with Dr. J. Allen Hynek and is the author of 20 books, including The Keys of Enoch. Oh, and he co-authored the book End of Suffering with Stanford Research Institute physicist Russell Targ. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's, quite that's a, some credentials. That's there. some credentials, yeah. And he was in communication with the nine prior to prior joining. to joining Lab Nine. Early Lab Nine sessions were performed by Phyllis Schlemmer, who in initiated contact with an entity simply known as Tom, who represented the nine. <laughs> that is so who call, call me, me Tom. Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Many of these communications are documented in Schlimmer's book, Only Planet of Choice, Essential Briefings from Deep Space. As an example of these communications, the book asserts that in 1975, Gene Roddenberry asked Tom, To whom am I talking? Do you have a name? I am Tom. I am the spokesman for the Council of Nine. In truth, I am Tehuti. Oh, there you go. He's Thoth. And yes, I am also Hamarcos. I am also Herenkar. I am also known as Thomas, and I am known as Atom. When asked of their origin, Tom stated, so Tom is just Atom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Tom stated, we are of the nine principles of the universe, yet together we are one. We are separate and one at the same time. 
Each represents a portion of energy, knowledge, wisdom, love, kindness, technology, and in continuity, it goes on until each portion of a spiral is composed of all that is important to bring complete understanding to each atom until it becomes one with us. There are in actuality multiplications and more, but in principle, there are nine. We are what is defined or we are what is identified as the Elohim. We wish you to know we are not God. We are collective and become one. We wish you to know that we are you as you are we. You created us, and out of that creation, you were created. Do not est un underestimate who you are and your ability. Know that all people are pure and that you are perfect and that all things are possible with you. Know also that we cannot exist without you and all souls, and neither can planet Earth nor the universe. When you understand that, you will understand your own life. At times in your world, people create confusion, for the density of it is a density of darkness. But always hold the light of truth in your own being, who you are, in your heart. We are with you always. We give you love, and we bring you peace. So it is later revealed that the nine principles, which collectively comprise the one god, Adam, are the gods Shu, Tefnut, Geb, Nut, Osiris, Isis, Seth, Nephthys, and, you guessed it, Horus. When asked for an explanation of their true form, Tom replies, We do not have a physical body, although we may put on the mantle of a physical body when it is necessary. It would be difficult for us to describe to you exactly what we appear like. We appear in many forms when that is necessary. And, your and in your thought process, we may appear as a human. We may appear as an energy ball. We may appear as a very bright light. We have evolved beyond the point of needing a physical type body as many souls need. We are always here, but you do not always see us. When I say we, I do not mean me, but I mean all of us. We are often observing. There are particular times in your life when we do not observe, and that is when you are involved with your desires. We do not understand this, and it is none of our affair. <laughs> so they're the Watchers and the Pantheon and the Elohim. And the uh, etymology of Thomas, uh, the masculine noun occurs throughout Semitic languages, always meaning twin. Ah, interesting. So Tom is then asked, what is the relationship of the nine to God and the devil? And Tom says, you cannot use that terminology of God and the opposite in the same sentence, for there is not of any equal to what you call God. For what you call God is the all-knowing, the total creation, all that is, that uh, that you call by the name that you have used, we speak of as the opposition. You cannot equate that together. You ask us what is our relationship, and we tell you now. We are not God. We have no relationship to the opposition. We are the council of nine that are in service to the creator. The creator is not destructive. The opposition is destructive. Hmm. So there are many more twists and turns to the story of the Nine that could easily fill an entire episode, but it is important to be cognizant that, as stated at the very beginning of this discussion, Puharik was stationed at the Army Chemical Center from 1953 to 1955, and while there he was deeply involved in experiments with hallucinogenic mushrooms and had ties to the CIA's MK Ultra program. <laughs> According to the authors of the books The Stargate Conspiracy during the 1950s and 60s, Puharik belonged to an organization of scientists and businessmen named Essentia Research Associates in New York. It conducted research into psychic abilities on behalf of government agencies such as the Pentagon, NASA, and the Atomic Energy Commission. There they are. How this information reflects on communications with the Nine is a matter of considerable debate. <clears throat> Yeah, so the AEC, you know, they show up in, in Valet's new book as being possibly the first ones to recover a crashed craft. It would have been the Atomic Energy Commission because they recovered it right near Trinity. So, and it may be the AEC that is the ones hiding a lot of this stuff. You could, you could interpret this as potentially being an op. If, yeah. If Paharic was involved with MKUltra... Uh, his his area of expertise was in mushrooms. In fact, he wrote a book on mushrooms. Um, you could argue that maybe he was influencing the panel to mm. lead them to believe it. But 
but then there were, you know, you know, other people that were in communication <laughs> with the nine independently. So it's yeah hard to say. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, if he's, I don't know. I mean, you know, mushrooms may be a path to this kind of stuff already. Exactly. So, yeah. Is that similar to ayahuasca or something? And they're meeting yeah. the same entity. And it's it's like, are if the nine is really a, a separate entity, right? And it, it's peak, picking people on purpose. That's why these people are connected because the nine is like, oh, this there's going to be a connection here, or there has been, or there will be, whatever these are. All right. Yeah, we should take a break. We've we probably gone We're long. Way over. Way over. Nobody's watching the sands of time. Yeah. <laughs> that means it's uh, good content. All That's right. right. We'll be back. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back from the brink. <laughs> yeah, this is crazy stuff, man. I don't know. Let's keep going. Kyle's cracking the beers. I got my second beer. Yeah. Second second show, first beer. Second beer. Second show, second beer. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't bring any beers for us. You know I got I got shiners in there. He's got no there. fucking beers, you know. Like he's <laughs> got the two beers. Doesn't guys, offer us anything. You guys need some beers? <laughs> I'd love a beer. Well, I'll be right back. <laughs> just, just wait. Just wait for me to go get them. <laughs> All right, I'm back. Yeah, I got Here's beers. Your beers, boys. Beers. Super fast beer service. That's right. Instantaneous beers. <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay. <clears throat> well, cheers. Yeah, go. yeah, yeah. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Good two <laughs> two episodes in one day. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll throw this into the mix. There is a lengthy discussion in the book Morning of the Magicians of a tradition that goes back to the time of Emperor Ahsoka, who reigned in India from 273 BC. The tradition speaks of nine unknown men who have on rare occasion contacted individuals such as Pope Sylvester II and have imparted to them secret knowledge, which notably includes techniques of propaganda and psychological warfare. Did I tell? Did I mention this on the show that I asked um, Sunil about the nine unknown men? <laughs> did I mention? Did that? Yeah, I didn't remember that. Yeah, the guy, the he uh, he owns one of the stores in town, and like I kind of, you know, we kind of build up a friendship. I go to the store all the time, and I know he's from India. His whole family is, and so I will. Whenever I'm in the store and I'm in line, and but there's nobody else behind me, and so I'm the only one there. I'll ask him some random question. I'll be like, "What did tell me about Vamanas, bro?" Right. <laughs> So I was in there one time. I was like, so what's the deal with the nine unknown men? He goes, who told you about those? <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. Sorry. <laughs> the, <clears throat> there's a little bit of a story with the, with the Pope Sylvester that's kind of strange. Allegedly, he, he went to India and he, was, he met or was, I guess, encountered the, the nine unknown men and he created this bronze head hmm. that would answer yes or no questions the theological questions wow. and this thing was documented and after he died suppose it was destroyed all right um and the, in some science journal they discussed it and they said that clearly he had mathematical knowledge or something or for him to be able to create this autonomous machine yeah some kind of you know right yeah and <laughs> automaton like mm -hmm. a clockwork strange, machine yeah strange story i thought it was a little bit too much of a tangent and we ended up taking it anyway but <laughs> yeah yeah it's still good <laughs> yeah so uh be that as it may in 1978 after receiving anonymous threats puharik's laboratory was mysteriously destroyed by arson <clears throat> becoming increasingly paranoid and fearing for his life he moved to mexico Years later, he returned to the U.S. and is alleged to have refused new CIA sponsorship offers 
and dedicated himself to privately sponsored research on bioelectromagnetics. Puharik died in 1995 after falling down the stairs in his home in South Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> falling. Right. During his life, Puharik managed to amass over 50 patents related to the medical field and electromagnetic wave emissions. If there is any validity to the information he is alleged to have received from the Nine, and as with the otherworldly communications receive, received by Dr. Dr. John D., this strongly suggests the existence of at least two opposing contingents of contingents. contingents engaged in theurgy, the influence of human affairs by divine or supernatural forces. Hmm. So why do you think this suggests two opposing? Because the nine speaks of the opposition. Yeah. Notice okay. they won't they won't use the name that <clears throat> when they asked the right, uh, yeah. they would not use the name devil. They yeah. just refer to it as the opposition. The opposition, yeah. Okay. <sighs> On May 27th in 1954, a housewife from Elliott, Maine, named Frances Swan, began communicating with extraterrestrial intelligences via automatic writing. This came to the attention of retired Rear Admiral Herbert Knowles, who happened to be Swan's next-door neighbor and a member and future board director of NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. This information soon reached the FBI, who conducted an investigation. So FBI documents state, Mrs. Swan stated that there were two spaceships from which she had been receiving messages. They were described as 150 miles wide, 200 miles in length, and 100 miles in depth. These ships are designated as M4 and L11, and they also contain motherships, which measure approximately 150 to 250 feet in, or 200 feet in length. There were approximately 5,000 of these motherships. Afa or Afa is the manager or commander of the ship M4, which is from the planet Uranus, and Ponar is the manager of the commander of the ship L11, which is from the planet Hatan. The messages from Afa and Ponar were warnings of the potential destruction of Earth caused by the detonation of nuclear weapons, which they claimed disrupts the magnetic field around the planet. And these beings were presently working on the floor of the Pacific Ocean, repairing fault lines that were in danger of shifting. <laughs> Furthermore, Afa would physically appear to officials from the Office of Naval, Naval Intelligence or would make contact by other means on a particular date in the summer of 1954, prior to the world-ending events to come in 1956. As noted previously, apocalyptic messages such as these are not unusual and obviously never seem to pan out as promised. But behind the scenes, the cause for concern by government officials was the fact that Mrs. Swan lived only 130 miles from Dr. Andre Puharik. Puharik. So according to a classified report prepared by Project Blue Books, Major Robert Friend, which J. Allen Hynek showed to Jacques Vallée, a secret meeting was held on July 9th, 1959, at a CIA office in Washington under the direction of Arthur Lundahl of the CIA's National Photographic Interpretation Center. Present at the meeting was a representative of the Office of Naval Intelligence and seven CIA officers. On July 6th, 1959, in the officer's presence, Mrs. Swan went into a trance and began communicating with the entities. The officers asked a series of technical questions, which they were certain were beyond Mrs. Swan's level of education or knowledge, but which she was quickly able to uh, answer correctly. The entities then agreed to respond through one of the officers present. So Naval Intelligence Officer Commander Larson, who had no previous psychic experience, entered a trance, and the entities began answering through him. The CIA interrogators eventually asked to see a spacecraft. Through Commander Larson, the interrogators were directed to the window where they observed the craft described as being round with the perimeter brighter than the center. When verification of this was attempted with radar operators in Washington, for some unknown reason, radar returned from the direction in which the ship was supposedly seen had blacked out at the time of the sighting. As incredulous as this story sounds, it was later restated on camera by Project Blue Book's uh, Maj Fr Major Friend in the 1974 documentary or documentary UFOs Past, Present, and Future. I'll post that video on the Discord. Okay. It's amazing. Hmm. 
I wonder how the guy just went into a trance. It's interesting. They just put him into it. Okay. I mean, this is the head of Project Blue Book that's seeing yeah. this. So. Yeah. I'm just thinking of the, you know, the, the setup. You got the woman that comes in there. She's used to going into a trance and communicating with these things, whatever they are. But then there's this random officer in there who presumably doesn't do this ever, and yet he goes right into a trance. There's a little more to this story that we'll get to. Later. <clears throat> okay. Uh, it's hard <laughs> for me to stomach. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know. It just, it seems like a sigh up. Yeah. You bring in the medium. She doesn't tell you what you want. So one of your own officers who already knows stuff, mm. he's the one who delivers the information that you need wow, to put she, on record. She was answered. She answered the questions that they didn't it's, think she would be able to answer. That's not saying there's not I'm a psyop saying. going, but yeah. if there was, it would seem as though it was. Well, you'll see. There are other. There were. There's more than one agency involved in these things. So if it's if it's an op, it's an op, an inner agency op. So she answers the questions, but doesn't. But then the officer delivers like the actual information. But remember, she had been the one delivering the apocalyptic messages. Yeah. Which fit the pattern of this. It's not like she's the only yeah. one doing this. It's yeah. Dozens. And yeah. Dozens the messages dozens. that don't come true right, they don't exactly. play out that's mm-hmm. what i'm saying it's yeah. just like see but the pattern and i don't even remember if i state this or not, but the pattern that and keel makes this really clear in his in uh, operation Tra- trojan horse is that he experienced this himself um he goes into a long explanation this is a complete huge tangent but but in the mothman prophecies that the way that whole deal came about he started receiving messages he was contacted in this thing whatever it is intelligence started predicting things and they came true and this was a pattern like okay you know at first you're skeptical and then they get after a while they tell you something's going to happen and it happens and and then they tell you something else and it happens so finally they gain your trust and as soon as you trust them yeah. that's when the deception begins yeah exactly and they started playing games with him they they predicted they predicted that something was going to happen uh, while um, the president. I'm so much, so many names and dates and everything in my head, or I can't remember specifically which one it was. But they predicted that when the president turned on the Christmas tree at the White House, that something was going to happen. So he believed it, and he tuned in because he thought that there was going to be. I don't remember if it was a bombing or something. So he tuned in to television to watch the lighting of the Christmas tree because Keel was all in. He believed it. And then nothing happened. And then he had been shown visions of Christmas gifts floating in the river. Was part of the thing that he was telling him was going to happen when he plugged when when the president plugged in the Christmas tree. So he assumed there was going to be a bombing or something at the White House. Yeah, yeah. Comes to find out that at that exact moment is when the bridge collapsed and the cars fell into the river. So what he was actually shown was the collapse of the bridge. Mm. So whatever the Mothman was or this thing was playing tricks on him. It was leading him to believe one thing when it was really something else, but there was some truth to it. It was not a complete deception. Yeah, yeah he was seeing the presence at Point Pleasant. Right. Yeah, so after the collapse. So is this thing, whatever this agency is behind it, and when I say agency, it could entirely be a government agency. It's an yeah, ag- yeah. Some form of intelligence is playing games with people is what, what this picture that is being painted. Agreed. Games are being played. (laughs) (laughs) All right. In the previous episode, the last we heard of the endearing L. Ron Hubbard was him sailing off the coast of Florida with Jack Parsons' savings and Sancha, otherwise known as Side Action Betty. (laughs) (laughs) As with nearly everything related to Hubbard, accounts of what happened next are inconsistent. However, the results are undeniable. 
While still in Florida, Hubbard and Betty were married, which apparently was in no way in which uh, which apparently no way inconvenienced by Hubbard's existing marriage to his wife Candy. He would soon attempt to mend fences with the Thelemites by alleging that all of his preceding actions were part of an elaborate undercover FBI investigation of Parsons' satanic cult. In May of 1950 edition of Astounding Science Fiction, Hubbard wrote an article entitled Dianetics, the Evolution of Science. The magazine's editor, John W. Campbell, prefaced the story with a glowing testimonial that praised Dianetics as a truly scientific method of mental therapy. It depicted the human brain as an optimum computing machine in which there are, uh, how do you say that word? Aberrative circuits? Yeah. Traumas from the past introduced to it from the outside world. If these circuits could be swept away, the optimum brain could be revealed and the subject would become clear. Within months, Hubbard published a book, which was an expanded version of his essay, and it became a national bestseller. Putting what he learned from Thelema to good use, within two years, Hubbard had formulated a religion around his book. Dianetics would become the central text of Scientology, which echoed the themes of the book, concerning itself not only with this life, but with past lives spent on other planets. Hubbard's background as a science fiction writer is evident in the underpinnings of his new religion, which, which centers around Xenu, the ruler of a galactic confederacy of once overpopulated planets. 75 million years ago, Xenu committed, Xenu committed mass genocide of his subjects through the use of hydrogen bombs, dispersing their disembodied souls, which were then implanted with false theological data by nefarious agents, which we still carry with us today as we continue to live on his prison planet. Scientology is defined as an applied philosophy dealing with the study of knowledge, which, through the application of its technology, can bring about desirable changes in the conditions of life. It is claimed to be a technology that was discovered, not invented. Hubbard described Scientology as the science of knowing how to know. While Crowley st struggled throughout his life to popularize the Thelema, even with the aid of the charismatic Parsons, Hubbard succeeded where they could not. The Church of Scientology became hugely successful, aided largely by Hubbard's connections in publishing the media and Hollywood. It achieved status as the true embodiment of the mainstream UFO cult. Yep. It's crazy. Oh, can't be. <laughs> Holy crap. Crazy how all this stuff is connected. I know. Oh, no. Look at this name. Srin Srinivasa oh, Ramana. Yeah, <laughs> Ramanajan. I think I did. No. Yeah, I'm trying to read that part. Srinivasa Ramanajan yeah. was an Indian mathematician who lived from 1887 to 1920. Although he had almost no formal training in mathematics, he made a substantial made substantial contributions to mathematical analysis, number theory, infinite series, and continued fractions, including solutions to mathematical problems that were then considered unsolvable. Ramanajan developed his own mathematical research in isolation. According to Hans Isaac, he tried to interest the leading professional mathematicians in his work, but failed for the most part. What he had to show them was too novel and too unfamiliar, and additionally presented in unusual ways, and they could not be bothered. A deeply religious Hindu, Ramanajan credited his substantial mathematical capacities to divinity and said that the mathematical knowledge he displayed was revealed to him by his family goddess, uh, Namagiri Thayar. <clears throat> he looked to her for inspiration in his work, and he said he received visions of scrolls of complex mathematical content unfolding before his eyes. He often said, an equation for me has no meaning unless it expresses a thought of God. Is this the guy that... More scrolls. Him? What? More scrolls. Yeah, more this scrolls. This is the guy that uh, started the string theory stuff, string right? String theory stuff, yeah. That's what it sounds like. Sounds very familiar. If it's not, then there's another Indian There's mathematic. another one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John Nash. John Nash was born in Bluefield in West Virginia in 1928 and was famously the principal character of the mu movie A Beautiful Mind. While at Princeton, Nash at arrived at a revolutionary new theory of rational conflict and cooperation, the Nash Equilibrium, which is considered one of the most influential ideas of the 20th century. By 23 years of age, Nash was already an instructor at MIT. 
He tackled the idea of embedding a surface, placing it into a space without tearing, creasing, or crossing itself. An embedding which does not distort the surface's intrinsic geometry is isometric. In other words, the surfaces above are isometric embeddings of the plane into three-dimensional space. Nash's proof of the isometric embedding problem came as a complete surprise to much of the mathematical community, and his methods were revolutionary. But he suffered terribly from his psychosis. He was terrified, anxious, preoccupied, and persecuted. However, his delusions were not random and obeyed almost inscrutable rules. He felt that he was simultaneously the epicenter of the universe, yet controlled by a psyche other than his own. He was both an abject petitioner and figure of enormous political or religious, albeit secret, importance. Nash assumed that his delusions and hallucinations were part of his genius. A friend once asked him, How could you, a mathematician, a man devoted to reason and logical proof, how could you believe that you were being recruited by aliens from outer space to save the world? And Nash's response was, because the ideas I had about supernatural beings came to me in the same way that mathematical ideas did. So I took them seriously. I don't think this is the same guy. This is a different person. Let me also point one other oh, thing out Nash that, is I did a not, person. Oh, okay. that I didn't write about. But in all of, the, all of the statements by the nine, they speak quite a bit about embedding. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. In 1967, Nash told a colleague that he had stopped taking his medication. And his colleague was upset at this and asked, why, when they were making you well, did you stop taking the drugs? Hang on a second. Sorry. The embedding thing. So is this like some kind of mathematical equation for what, like, the idea of like the manifestation of a spiritual being in our universe or something? Like the way you put something into another... I, I don't pretend to understand it. It was complex. But m from my interpretation of what I read that the nine were saying, the, what it struck me that what they were describing was the Mobius strip. No, I'm talking about Nash. His, right. his equations of showing how you can like embed. But the embedding is the full, in effect, it sounded like they're trying to do the same thing. They're, it's folding of space. Okay. Without folding it, it says. Well. Yeah, yeah. Right. What, what I'm talking about is like. Continuous. Yeah, like I see what you're getting at. Yeah. The, it's this, is the how you, yeah this is how you embed an you object. Project into something into a different dimension without yeah. destroying stuff right. or opening yeah. a giant portal that just like, yeah. wipes everything out or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> So his colleague asked him why he stopped taking the drugs, and Nash answered, If I take drugs, I stop hearing the voices. To Nash, taking away his delusions and hallucinations would be taking away his genius, which was his most treasured gift. And I would, you know, I'd agree with that. The, the genius, you know, the Greeks considered that to be something separate from you, right? <clears throat> okay, Alexander Grothendieck was born in, German, in Berlin, Germany. Berlin, Germany, in 1928, is, con is considered among the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century. <clears throat> Grothendieck altered mathematics with a velocity that is hard to articulate. He used commutative algebra to solve complex geometrical problems. He innovated in pure mathematics, but his work has applications in cryptography and coding theory. <clears throat> Using tools from algebraic geometry, category theory, and topology, he created an entirely new paradigm. He taught a course on topological vector spaces, the notes from which were subsequently published by uh, the University of Sao Paulo. But Grothendieck burned many, many of his papers in 1991, through, though tens of thousands of un unpublished pages remain. For years before his death in 2014, at age 86, he could be seen through a ground floor window, writing long into the night. The pages revealed an obsession with an environmental apocalypse. He was said to rave to locals about God and the devil and renounced all of his mathematical work. French mathematician Michael uh, Demajour. Is that how you say that? Do you know? Nope. Okay. 
French. <laughs> in a tribute published in Notices of the American Mathematical so Society, stating, Grothendick always seemed essentially different. He was an alien. This sentiment was echoed by Mar Marvin J. Greenberg, a prof professor emeritus of mathematics at the University of California at Santa Cruz, who stated, My first impression on seeing him lecture was that he had been transported from an advanced alien civilization in some distant solar system to visit ours in order to speed up our intellectual evolution. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what? In the years prior and following his retirement, Grothendick began sending strange letters to former colleagues and friends expressing his spiritual beliefs. For instance, in 1987 and in 1988, he wrote a 300-page manuscript accompanying 500 pages of notes entitled The Key to Dreams or Dialogue with the Good Lord, in which he expressed his conviction that God exists and that he speaks to people through their dreams. A few years later, in 1990, he wrote a letter entitled The Letter of Good News, which he addressed to 250 people, declaring that the Age of Liberation will commence on the Day of Truth, 14th of October, 1996. Another apocalyptic. Yeah, I guess it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, Carrie Mullis was a UC Berkeley Nobel Prize winner who dreamed up a technique to exponentially replicate tiny scraps of DNA. He called it polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. One night in 1985, as Mullis took a stroll on his property in Mendocino County, he encountered a glowing raccoon. Good evening, doctor, the raccoon said. <laughs> the next thing Mullis remembered, he was walking along a nearby road in the light of morning, a time gap he attributed to alien abduction. He detailed the encounter in his memoir, Dancing Naked in the Minefield. Wow. I didn't know that one. <laughs> PCR? Yeah, he's the guy that made the, the PCR. PCR test. Yeah. I thought it was like a an acid trip or something. He, he supposedly was involved something with something having to do with LSD too. So who knows? It could have been a trick. Yeah, I think he I think he also saw like the process on an acid trip or mm. something like that. Yeah. Okay, so now we remind listeners that as discussed in the previous episode, Dr. John D was a brilliant mathematician and cartographer responsible for the expression of formulas that are completely unexplainable. From this one could conclude that the unseen forces involved are mathematically inclined or they're constantly tricking us with their mathematical bullshit <laughs> <laughs> what was the guy's name the, the pcr carrie mollis i believe it was okay watcher was asking yeah i just skipped. i think he had that up there no. oh no the mathematician which one <laughs> they're all mathematicians which one? yeah carrie carrie mollis no he's talking guy. about the one before that they're all mathematicians. Watcher, Alexander. Yeah. Talking about Alexander Grothendick. Yes. All right. Go ahead. Keep keep going. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the ancient Romans did not believe a brilliant individual was a genius. They instead believed that they had a genius. At birth, each person was assigned a genius that served effectively as a guide or guardian angel. The Greeks referred to these same spirits as daemons. <clears throat> Elizabeth Gilbert is the author of the international best-selling book, Eat, Pray, Love, and has a TED Talk where she speaks about the creative process. During her presentation, Gilbert very delicately uh, elucidates the phenomenon of the muse and points out the high rate of suicide among highly creative people. Although she does not make the connection, we believe, as previously illustrated, mental disorders are also associated with highly intelligent individuals. <clears throat> Gilbert goes on to describe creative experiences, such as that of the renowned poet Ruth Stone, who claims that her poems would sometimes chase her like a thunderous cloud, and she would grab them by the tail and pull them back as she transcribed them, and they would be perfect and complete, but written backward from the last word to the first. Just like the... <laughs> Enochian tablets. Wow. 
As discussed in episode 186, UFOs Part 4, there are also those who seek assistance from their daemon. In addition to the famously example previously cited, such as Socrates, Napoleon, and Jung, we also have contemporary examples such as Dr. Tom Zinser, a clinical psychologist and hypnotherapist in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Dr. Zinser is the author of the book Soul-Centered Healing, a psychologist's extraordinary journey into the realms of subpersonalities, spirits, and past lives, and has enjoyed a 15-year collaboration with a spirit entity named Jared, who consults with him about the problems his patients are facing and suggests specific ways to help them overcome traumas, relieve anxieties, and generally live happier and more fulfilling lives. Doesn't Jared speak to him through a, an employee? No, his, his employee is the one that put him in contact. Actually, oh. <clears throat> his, his receptionist said someone, she was in contact with Jared. Yeah. And Jared wanted to speak with him. Oh, okay. Alex Sakaris, skeptical, yeah. has interviewed him, I think, a couple of times. Yeah. It's fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. The December 20 through 27, 1997 issue of the Brit British Medical Journal published a paper d by Dr. Oh, man, look at that name. <laughs> Ikechuku Obialo Azewanwe of London. <laughs> That is prefaced by the statement, a difficult case. It tells the story of a stable and competent housewife with children in her mid-40s, referenced only as A.B. In the winter of 1984, A.B. was home reading a book when suddenly she heard a voice in her head that said, Please, don't be afraid. I know it must be shocking for you to hear me speaking to you like this, but this is the easiest way I could think of. My friend and I used to work at the children's hospital, Great Ormond Street, and we would like to help you. A.B. was obviously terrified and thought she was hallucinating. To ease her concern, the voice stated, To help you see that we are sincere, we would like you to check out the following. And the voice then gave her three separate pieces of information, which she did not know at the time. Upon subsequent verification, the information conveyed was accurate. However, this did little to calm her fear. In a state of panic, A.B. went to see her regular doctor, who referred her urgently to Dr... Azuyone. Frick, how do I say this name? Azu Azwanye. That's it. Azwanye. After an extensive examination, she was diagnosed with functional hallucinatory psychosis. He offered her general supportive counseling as well as medication. This tr treatment appeared to work, and soon after, she was able to travel overseas. While on vacation, the voices returned and instructed her to return to England immediately to seek medical treatment. Additionally, the article states... She was also having other beliefs of a delusional nature. She returned to see Dr. Oswanye, but the voices had directed her to a specific address. <clears throat> to reassure her that this was just a hallucination, her husband drove her to the address they provided, and it was the computer tomography department of the London hospital. When they arrived, arrived there, the voices told her to go in and ask to have a brain scan for two reasons. She had a tumor, and her brain stem was inflamed. Not knowing what to do, she again saw Dr. Oswanye and informed him of what she had been told. In order to convince her that this was a, simply a symptom of her psychosis, he requested a brain scan from that specific lab. When asked for the grounds for the request, he informed them, informed them that he found no physical signs suggestive of an intracranial space occupying lesion and that the purpose of the scan was to essentially to reassure his patient. This request was declined, and Dr. Azwanye was chastised for suge suggesting the expensive procedure on such grounds. Man. After negotiation, a scan was performed in April, and the initial findings led to an enhanced secondary scan a month later that revealed a left posterior frontal mass with the appearance of a tumor. The consulting neurosurgeon noted the absence of headache or any other focal neurological effects related to the mass and discussed with A.B. and her husband the pros and cons of immediate surgery for the removal. They chose to proceed, and the voices agreed with their decision. The surgery was performed, and a 2.5-inch by 1.5-inch tumor was dissected from the surface of her brain. When she regained consciousness after the operation, the voices told her, We are pleased to have helped you. Goodbye. Oh my god, that's crazy. The report states that there were no post-operative complications and no return of the hallucinatory voices or the delusions which she had expressed. 
So Dr. Azwanye notes, it is well known that intracranial lesions can be associated with psychiatric symptomology, but this is the first and only instance I have come across in which hallucinatory voices sought to reassure the patient of their genuine interest in her welfare, offered her a specific diagnosis, there were no clinical signs that would have alerted anyone to the tumor, directed her to the type of hospital best equipped to deal with her problem, expressed pleasure that she had at last received the treatment they desired for her, bid her farewell, and thereafter disappeared. A.B. never saved a baby from a burning building, nor made a world-changing discovery. There was never a satisfactory explanation for why she was the subject of this perceived intervention, but how many of these types of interventions go either unreported or unnoticed? Wow. That's a really that cool really story. Cool. <laughs> I love stories like wow. that. All right. Break time. Yeah. demand a free-for-all episode with you two guys just talking about all of this stuff okay because like the breaks conversation they're bringing up all this crap i don't know who these people are or what are these connections and they're like oh well we didn't want to mess up the presentation i'm just like dude man when this whole thing's over i demand a show with no planning <laughs> I don't think I could function that way. <laughs> yes, you can. You're, well, you're going to figure out how yeah, it works. Yeah, just come in and sit down and we'll talk about this shit. But yeah, one of the things no I brought computers. up. computers. And I'll just mention it real quick. We don't have to go into it in depth, but I would recommend that people look into the work of Chris Knowles. Uh, he's been on Where Did the Road Go? He's talked with Sicaris on um, Skeptico. Uh, Skeptico. I think he's been on Grimerica, but yeah, you can look him up. He's got a blog, uh, Secret Sun, um, and he's basically he basically studies and, and is constantly pointing out the occult symbolism that are rampant throughout uh, just modern stuff, like large ceremonies. He's always you know he's always looking at the Olympics or looking at the you know the, the Super Bowl uh, halftime show or. And he's just he's just like, look at all this. Notice that they're doing these rituals in plain sight in front of millions of people on purpose. That's the documentary were... that I mentioned earlier that that I said if you watch the Crowley one and then you watch this, that they they flow seamlessly together. Yeah. It's called Out of Shadows. Mm. And it's talking about the occult yeah. symbolism that's in all of Hollywood. Yeah. You know. And Noel specifically has pointed out before all of the occult symbolism and involved in the space in, in, you know, in going to space, like that, they're just that they're, they're, the launches are on occult specific days, you know, ritual days. And he's like, yes, obviously there are launch windows to, to achieve specific goals when you're launching into space, but there are windows that don't have to be on so, a day that's also an occult, like, <laughs> ritual day. They always pick those, though, you know. Does so, SpaceX and these other guys, like... That's you know, a good question. Blue I Origin and all that, do, are they doing this, I'm too? I'm sure they probably are. I don't know. But, uh, you know, NASA, he's like, the whole the whole moon thing, you can see all the occult symbolism in it. And, and, and clearly, we pointed out, you know, the, the names of the gods of the yeah, programs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, look, I mean, the, I always thought that was just, you know, a throwback to because they were talking about these gods flying around in space and stuff. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. You know, these guys knew if right? you look, these guys were all interested in the ancient pop, yeah. pop culture. You look, you know, Lady Gaga, you look at mm -hmm. uh, you, um, what's her Billie Eilish. Um, um, yeah, boy, I'm not, I, I not my type of music, but sorry. they use a lot of that symbolism. One eye, you know, covering one eye yep. and. It, their music videos, there's a lot of um, oh, Egyptian-themed, yep. you know, symbology <laughs> or symbolism, should yeah. I say. All right. 
Uh, let's dive back into I this. I demand it. <laughs> Kyle demands a free for all. A episode. free for all. Free Uns- for all. Yeah. Unscripted conversation. Well, it's episode. not scripted, but it's. It, I, I mean, uh, off the cuff. Mm. No, no prep. No show prep. Okay. I'm a professional, guys. So trust <laughs> me. <laughs> In light of all these alleged communications with unseen forces, who or what might be we might we be dealing with? Ghostly voices from beyond the grave? Angels? Aliens? It turns out there have been studies to ascertain an answer. In 1972, Dr. George Owen, a university lecturer, geneticist, mathematician, and member of the Toronto Society for Psychical Research. Ah, I know what this is. <laughs> Assembled a test group consisting of Owen's wife, Iris Owen, former chairperson of Mensa in Canada, Margaret Sparrow, industrial designer Andy H., his wife, Lorne, heating engineer Al Peacock, accountant Bernice M., and bookkeeper Dorothy O'Donnell, and sociology student Sidney K. This group was convened for a parapsychological study which would be overseen by psychologist Dr. Joel Witten. The the objective of the study would be to attempt contact with an individual named Philip Aylesford. Yes, the Philip experiment. Aylesford's biography read, Aylesford was an aristocratic Englishman living in the middle 1600s at the time of Oliver Cromwell. He had been a supporter of the king and was a Catholic. He was married to a beautiful but cold and frigid wife, Dorothy, the daughter of a neighboring nobleman. One day, when out riding on the boundaries of his estates, Philip came across a gypsy encampment and saw there a beautiful, dark-eyed, raven-haired gypsy girl, Margot, and fell instantly in love with her. He brought her back secretly to live in the gatehouse near the stables of Diddington Manor, his family home. For some time, he kept his love nest secret, but eventually Dorothy, realizing he was keeping someone else there, found Margot and accused her of witchcraft and stealing her husband. Philip was too scared of losing his reputation and his possessions protest protest at the trial of Margot, and she was convicted of witchcraft and burned at the stake. Philip was subsequently subsequently stricken with remorse that he had not tried to defend Margot and used to paste used to pace the battlements of Diddington in despair. Finally, one morning his body was found at the bottom of the battlements whence he had cast himself in a fit of agony and remorse. In September 1972, The group began their sittings, informal gatherings in which they would discuss Philip and his life and meditate on him. These settings, conducted in a fully lit room, went on for about a year with no results. Some members of the group occasionally claimed they felt a presence in the room, but there was no result they could consider any kind of communication from Philip. The group eventually decided they might have better luck if they attempted to duplicate the atmosphere of a classic spiritualist seance. They dimmed the room's lights, sat around a table, sang songs, and surrounded themselves with pictures of the type of castle they imagined Philip lived in, as well as the objects from that period. And it worked. During one evening evening seance, the group received its first communication from Philip in the form of a distinct rap on the table. Soon, Philip was answering questions asked by the group, one rap for yes, two for no. And they knew it was Philip because, well, they asked him. (laughs) The sessions took off from there, producing a range of phenomena that could not be explained scientifically. Through the table wrapping communication, the group was able to learn finer details about Philip's life. He even seemed to express his personality, conveying his likes and dislikes and his strong views on various subjects, made plain by the enthusiasm or hesitancy of his knockings. His spirit was also able to move the table, sliding it from side to side, despite the fact that the floor was covered with thick carpeting. At times, it would even dance on one leg. Philip's psychokinetic powers were amazing and completely unexplained. If the group asked Philip to dim the lights, they would dim instantly. When asked to restore the lights, he would oblige. The table around which the group was sat was almost always the focal point of peculiar phenomena. After feeling a cool breeze blow across the table, they asked Philip if he could cause it to start and stop at will. And he could, and he did. The group noticed that the table itself felt different to the touch whenever Philip was present, having a subtle electric or alive quality. On a few occasions, a fine mist formed over the center of the table, and the group reported that the table would sometimes be so animated that it would rush over to meet latecomers to the session or even trap members in the corners of the room. 
The climax of the experiment was a seance conducted before a live audience of 50 people. The session was also filmed as part of a television documentary. Fortunately, Philip did not have stage fright and performed above expectations. Besides table wrappings, other noises around the room, and making lights blink on and off, the group actually attained a full levitation of the table. It rose only a half inch above the floor, but this incredible feat was witnessed by the group and the film crew. Unfortunately, the dim lighting prevented the levitation from being captured on the film, but the footage is available on YouTube. However, by far, Philip's most astonishing feat was the fact that he never existed. Philip's entire persona was a complete fabrication, specifically concocted for the purposes of the experiment. Similar studies were later conducted by other groups allegedly with the same pattern of results. So this begs the question, was Philip a manifestation formed by the collective imagination of the group? Or was the group contacting an entity attempting to deceive them by assuming Philip's identity? <clears throat> The answer to these questions may not only present a solution to the conundrum posited in Brothers of the Serpent episode 211, why are there no Neanderthal ghosts, <laughs> but it might also support John Keel's assertion that attempted communications with those beyond the grave may elicit unreliable and undesirable results. The other possibility, well, you said it manifestation, the idea that it was a tulpa, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, we've talked about we've talked about this before. We've mentioned it briefly, the Philip experiment. They basically just completely make up this guy's story, and then they all start meditating on him and thinking about him or whatever, and eventually they start getting the same kinds of responses you would get at a regular seance trying to call up somebody who was real and died or something. The point of the experiment, in part, being showing that, well, you get something whether the person was real or not, so that yeah. doesn't, you know... It, maybe it's the so rich, you don't know what you're getting. Right, it's the ritual the point. involved that might be the yes, yeah. I just yeah, whenever this channeling stuff, and they're like, oh yeah, we're channeling this person. It's like you don't know what you're getting. Yeah, they they rapped once when we asked if that was who it was. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How could they know that? <laughs> <clears throat> okay, Ray Bosch. Boshe. Boshe. Ray Boshe is an Anglican priest with a master's degree in theology from St. Mark's School of Divinity and a BA from Peru State College, serving in the Celebration Anglican Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. He was also the founder and former director of the Fortean Research Center and a former Nebraska State Director for MUFON. In 1991, Boshe was contacted at the church by two Christians who claimed to be physicists working in weapons research and development for the Department of Defense, and wished to meet with him. He agreed, and the first of two meetings took place at the Cornhusker Hotel in Lincoln on November 25th, 1991, and it lasted approximately three and a half hours. During the meeting, the individuals presented their identifications from the National Security Agency, Fort Meade, uh, and the Defense Intelligence Agency in Washington, D.C. Following this initial meeting, Boshe was able to independently verify the credentials of both individuals. During the meeting, the men engaged Boshe in a theological discussion and presented him with many related questions. It was evident that the individuals were facing some form of spiritual turmoil. Eventually, they disclosed their involvement in a project entailing contact with non-human entities for the development of weapons and intelligence technologies. Although these entities presented themselves as extraterrestrial beings, through their research it was concluded that the entities were instead demonic in nature. Research findings showed that regardless of how benevolent any of the dealings they had with these entities seemed, that always end up being tainted in some way, and ultimately turned out negatively, and nothing beneficial ever resulted. The matter in which this information was conveyed left Boshe with the impression that this had been a lengthy involvement. The entities were said to possess extraordinary and lethal mental abilities, and it was the objective of the DOD program to attempt to control and exploit their abilities, in part through the use of of rites and occult rituals. Okay, so if these are demons that are giving, like, giving people knowledge on how to build weapons, like in your example, like, here, we'll hand you a spear, why don't they just give nuclear weapons all throughout history, right? I mean, why, why isn't... In other words... If it was aliens, 
and we're talking aliens in the physical sense of like people with their own politics on other planets and whatever. It makes sense that they wouldn't want to just give us ridiculously high technology all the time, but that they might play around with causing wars and stuff with yeah, utilizing a little bit of the technology that yeah, we have at the time. You can increase your crossbow efficiency. Yeah, by exactly. Doing this. Yeah. Whereas if it was a demon, they already understand the universe and they know how all this stuff works. So they can just like, you know, well, let's just give them stone technology for a while. And, uh, <laughs> Consider the timeline that I'm presenting. They, what? Consider where we Well, started. the modern timeline. Yeah. Right. Why not a thousand years okay. ago? Okay. For example, in in like in other oh, words, right. if your if your objective is to say wipe out people or control people, this, why this, not give some butt flappers, you know, group like all this knowledge so that they can just take over the world, and then things go as you want them to go. You know, it's just kind of weird. It's like it doesn't make sense. All right, if there's an we opposing talk, force, we talked about at the end of the last one that <clears throat> Parsons eventually lost his, his security clearances because of his activities. Yeah. Who else? Maybe you or may or may not know this. What, who other, what other very famous historical figure lost his security clearances shortly after his discoveries? I don't know. Oppenheimer. Hmm. That's Again. not answering the question, though. Well, I mean, the question in other is words, like if they, if these are demonic entities, in other words, they're they have access because they are not of this like plane of existence. They have access to like like in the in the legends, right? They they like Paimon has all this knowledge of the universe and the workings of the universe and all this kind of stuff, and they can dish it out as they see fit. Why wouldn't they, why would they hold back certain things? Because it doesn't matter to them. It's not a, why would they be worried about physical abilities of a, of a race of animals on a planet? Whereas an actual alien race would be worried about our abilities to manipulate physics. You I see what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know that, I, I see where you're going with this and I, I totally understand. It's a valid point, but. From my perspective, and I think from the framework of this presentation, alien and demon are not mutually exclusive. In other words, we're just, again, it's we're dealing with an intelligence. That's why I... I that we may perceive as being demonic. That does not mean it's not extraterrestrial. It may, it may have... It that, that's why have, I made the point that, right. like, yeah, there, 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 are other beings existing in the universe. In in this universe, they're physical beings. They have their own politics. They have their own system, and they might be looking at us like, like we we might look at a foreign country that could be a threat. Whereas, if this is a a demon in the traditional sense, human physical ability or the, their ability to manipulate physics, why would that become a threat? It's not a threat to them. That's what I mean. So why hold back the technology until we're already almost there and then give it to us? That doesn't make any sense. That's just laziness. Ba based on, <laughs> yeah, we, we don't know what kind of timeline. Again, it's too it hard to teach as the though, butt flapper all that shit to get a nuclear weapon. But <laughs> the the if you go, if we're going okay. We go back to what I we, where we started. Go back where this conversation began. What did Enoch say? What did the fallen angels do? What was the first thing the Watchers did? They gave us technology. It gave us forbidden knowledge. Yeah. Right? And they taught us metallurgy. But only makeup us. and smelting and beer. <laughs> well, and apparently alloys and, and astrology and the technology of rituals. It refers to it as a technology. Yeah. Yeah, the technology of rituals and the names of the stars and the meanings of them and how to read the heavens. Yeah, that's See, why we, that it makes it seem more likely that they are 
physical beings that also exist elsewhere in Their our flesh universe. and blood extraterrestrials. <laughs> I mean, look at the hair, bro. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's more complicated. I think it's, it, again, go back to Enoch. You're saying there's more than one type. It's, they're all, I make, I made this analogy at one time. Um, I was trying, cause I have sometimes I, like I have a concept in my head. I can't put it in words. And the way I kind of relate it is, uh, is seeing these different things and you're trying to say, well, that's a, you know, that's an angel and that's a, you know, a, a, a fairy. And that's a, that imagine a cat inside of a parking structure. And there's cars driving around all of it, and, and it's trying to avoid getting run over by the cars. By the, you know, it's, is the cat looking at this and saying, oh, you know, there's a Chevrolet and there's a Ford and there, there's it, it, it's all the same to it. Yeah. But behind the wheel of those cars is there, there's humans back there. It's not even, in other words, the, the cat never even considered that there's a person operating that thing that it's trying to stay away from. And it's definitely not considering that it's in a structure designed for these vehicles and all the people parking the cars are going to the hotel right next door. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it can't get the big picture is what you're saying. Right. Yeah. But still, I think Kyle's question is valid. And I, even through all of these examples and everything we've read, there's nothing in here that I would say is completely outside the bounds of technology. No, absolutely that's what not. I'm pointing out is yeah. that all like when I'm looking at it with this frame of mind, it just says aliens, not actual, you know, uh, uh, metaphysical beings from a different, like go back to the beginning where I gave my analogies and I was, in other words, I, I spoke of the potential of a civilization advancing technologically yeah, yeah, to the yeah, point yeah. And of looking transcending over, physical yeah. existence. I understand. Yes. It's still technology. That's, and they, yeah. yeah, they still, I, I totally get that. And I'm not arguing with you. I'm arguing with the guy who was mm -hmm. saying, this was not aliens. This was oh, no. demonic. Yeah. That's well, the physicist. Wait, in there. that's, mm -hmm. there. There's a lot more. We're just starting the story. There's a lot more to this. I'm just, yeah. I think it's a good point. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, man. And it's going to explain things that we've discussed in previous episodes. They kind of, that stuff was leading to this. Now you're going to get, uh, you're finally going to get answers to at least something. <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll also make the point <laughs> that if these same extraterrestrial, ex super advanced, like transcended matter species yet still exist in this universe, are intera have been interacting with our species since time immemorial, then these people are right. They are demons because that's what the demons were named yeah, after. Yeah, yeah. You can't yes. get hooked. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I know. Forget the label. <laughs> that's why I was trying to not use the label yeah, and yeah, yeah. say that this is a civilization with politics that lives on a planet yes, somewhere yes. versus yeah. an that's interdimensional being that doesn't care if we, ha if we can manipulate the physics of this world. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to, and it's very hard to get past those labels because it's it's like you, you've built these things up in your mind your whole life, and now you're like there. Maybe that's not exactly what it is. That's why I say they're more like placeholders. They're not necessarily definitively something. A demon is this. No, it's yeah. not quite that simple. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Agreed. Not simple. <laughs> It was the opinion of the physicists that psychotronic and remote viewing technologies developed by the DOD in conjunction with or derived from these entities were part of an elaborate deception and the entities were the causal factor for the phenomena observed. In short, humanity was being deceived into believing that it was receiving visitations from aliens when in reality, demonic forces were secretly preparing us for Armageddon. <laughs> and... The DOD's overwhelmingly reckless dabbling into the occult to attempt to reach a Faustian pact with these forces was inevitably doomed to fail and only destined to make matters much worse. So we should point at this point, remind the listeners of the anecdote presented in the previous episode regarding the advice offered to the DOD during World War II by Carl Jung, uh, which was what? You remember? Remember Carl Jung suggested when... 
an organization at the Pentagon asked him to give an opinion, he said it would appear that the that the Nazis have made some type of an accord. Oh, yes, that's right. And I suggest you do the same. Well, yeah. Coincidentally, the 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 organization or the group that Young was advising, um, their the acronym they use for their documents is Top Secret Magic. Oh, magic, of course. Okay, how do you say this guy's name again? I forgot. Bo Boche? Yeah, Ray Boche. Yeah, Boche was left with the impression that he was approached due to his unique perspective as a priest and a theologian with an extensive background in the study of UFOs due to their moral and ethical consternation with being involved in such research. <clears throat> Boche had a second meeting with the two physicists at the same location on January 24th, 1992, and later shared some of the information regarding the meetings with Linda Moulton Howe in June of 1994, which was later published in her book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2. In 2006, researcher and author Nick Redfern contacted Boche to schedule an interview to obtain details about his meeting with the physicists. Following the interview, Redfern decided to trace back the origins of the preposterous claims, which were obviously either the personal beliefs of a couple of religious fanatics or some form of counterintelligence scheme. Redfern was able to deduce a connection to a particular Air Force base in Nebraska, where he called and requested to speak with someone in the Air Force Office of His Special Investigations. When asked what the call was regarding, he chose to be honest and told the receptionist that he was writing an article about a couple of government agents who believed that the UFO phenomenon was somehow connected with demons. He was asked a few more questions and promptly brushed off. Three days later, he received a call back by an elderly woman from the base, and she said, Mr. Redfern, I understand you want to meet with someone from the Collins elite. He responded that he had no idea what she was talking about. And she said, the devil, UFOs, the story, the story. With utter surprise, he acknowledged and was told to expect a call from Mr. Duke. Eleven days later in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Redfern met face-to-face -face with 86-year-old Richard Duke, a former agent for the Central Intelligence Agency and a senior member of the Collins elite. It wasn't long into their conversation before Duke explained that by the late 1940s, Jack Parsons' per peculiar activities drew the attention of U.S. intelligence agencies, and they learned that there was far more to the story than anyone outside the government could ever have suspected. Their investigation dug much deeper into his dealings with Aleister Crowley and L. Ron Hubbard and their possible role in generating the UFO phenomenon. Duke brought along a dossier on Parsons, <clears throat> which contained many original documents regarding his investigation, as well as those by other agencies. He stated, We learned this wasn't the first time the FBI had been speaking with Parsons. Major Sam Bruno himself told us they had a meeting with Parsons after the Kenneth Arnold sighting. And there were tales of Parsons being linked into this, into Arnold. As a strange coincidence, it turns out that Parsons met Arnold through his publisher, Ray Palmer, who, as the editor of Amazing Stories, was a friend of science fiction writer L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> Duke also pointed out another connection. He stated, Air Force also had reports on Parsons knowing Robert Goddard out at Roswell. We all knew something happened at Roswell with the crash in 47 that wasn't a weather balloon. We knew that. Grapevine things. Rumors you hear. But there were some of those guys in OSI who said it had to mean something that Jackie Boy was linked with Arnold and with people like God Goddard at Roswell. Furthermore, Parsons, who had claimed to have a UFO sighting himself, publicly proclaimed that UFOs would ultimately, quote, play a part in converting the world to Crowleyanity. Unquote, which only heightened the Air Force's concern over Parsons' Parsons's involvement in the phenomenon. And he went further and stated that in 1948, the OSI planned a meeting with Parsons and asked him if his things with Crowley and Hubbard and trying to bring in equivalent things like Crowley's lamb, there was something he wanted to tell them about what he knew about all this. And according to Duke... When confronted and pressed for answers, a somewhat uncomfortable Parsons conceded that there probably was a connection, that the UFO wave of 1947 probably was linked with his door-opening actions, and that it was not down to chance that he knew Arnold, or that he had a tangential link to the town of Roswell. Duke stressed, The Air Force knew they had something with all this, but they weren't really sure what. 
A small project was established at Wright-Patterson that made subtle and secret appeals to experts within the fields of demonology, ancient religions, and occult practices who could hopefully provide some answers with respect to what it was that Parsons might have set in motion, wittingly or not, and which the military was now struggling to comprehend. God. Duke also noticed that Charles Taze Russell, a prominent early 20th century Christian restorationist minister, had once predicted that the countdown to the end of the world would begin on October 2nd, 1914, and that this date would initiate the surfacing of the Antichrist and the harlot Babylon the Great. John Carter, a biographer of Jack Parsons, noted, It is ironic that, Jack Par- that John Parsons, who would later attempt to incarnate Babylon and who would also sign an oath stating that he was the Antichrist, was born the very day of Russell's es- eschatological event. Duke indicated that directly in the wake of the Washington, D.C. UFO incursions, shortly after Parsons' death in 1952, members of the Collins elite met with Air Force officials at the Pentagon to discuss funding for their project, which was to be funneled through the CIA's Directorate of Plans. Concerning this, he stated, And this is exactly why it was kept all so secret in the beginning. Everyone, particularly the Pentagon boys, knew the hammer was going to come down on all this if Congress found out good U.S. dollars were being used to pay for a study of demonology and flying saucers. Maybe a little more mundane than you might want to hear. But that really was the primary reason for the secrecy with us. Not a big conspiracy about what we were doing, but a lot of anger and probably a hell of a lot of ridicule that would come tumbling out if anyone else found out. But there were other connections that were also concerning. For example, self-proclaimed contactee George Adamski wrote his book Flying Saucers Have Landed with an Irish aristocrat named Desmond Leslie, who was known to have personal connections to Aleister Crowley in a long and rich history with the occult. George Hunt Williamson became fascinated by the occult as a teenager and ultimately became a leading figure in the contactee movement. Williamson's reported channeling extraterrestrials and researcher Sean Devney stated... When Williamson started to channel, it was something truly inexplicable. He would begin speaking in several different voices, one right after the other. In 1954, Williamson published the book The Saucers Speak, which focused on his well-publicized attempts to contact extraterrestrials via shortwave radio and Ouija boards. (laughs) Richard Duke stated that from late 1952 to the middle of 1953, There were a couple of members of the Collins elite who still believed that the contactee phenomenon involved literal extraterrestrials. But as investigations continued and as more data came to the fore, the group reached a consensus that the entities were highly deceptive and were telling the contactees precisely what they wanted to hear. Namely, that they were extraterrestrial and they were benevolent. There we go. And they're friendly space brothers. Another example was that of Francis Swan, who we discussed earlier. That's someone who was communicating with extraterrestrials through automatic writing, lived next door to Admiral Herbert Knowles, there's Knowles, Mm. a director of NICAP, was interpreted as evidence that demonic forces were attempting to influence a significant player in NICAP to deceive them into fully endorsing the extraterrestrial hypothesis to explain the UFOs. Furthermore, three of the seven CIA officers in attendance when AFA spoke through Commander Larson were members of the Collins elite, and they were very concerned by the fact that some intelligence officials were being seduced into entering altered states to contact what might just as well have been demons as extraterrestrials. Nope. (laughs) (laughs) One and the same. (laughs) The allegations that Crowley and Parsons, as well as many contactees such as Adamski, Van Tassel, Williamson, and Swan, were communicating communicating with entities via occult rituals, Ouija boards, and automatic writing was enough to convince the few remaining members of the Collins elite that the contact was with demonic rather than extraterrestrial forces. So let us remind regular listeners of the podcast that Bruce Fenton, author of Exogenesis, Hybrid Humans, who was a guest on Brothers of the Serpent episode 155, had no knowledge or interest in aliens or UFOs until he started receiving information on the subject via automatic writing. As if all this was not bizarre enough, and if there is any doubt about Richard Duke's allegations, in 1969, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, former head of the CIA's MK Ultra program, now working under Alan Dulles, who was in a relationship with Mary Bancroft of Puharek's Round Table Foundation, received funding for a new project, 
which became known as M.K. Often. Author Gordon Thomas wrote in his book Secrets and Lies, A History of CIA Mind Control and Germ Warfare. Operation Often was intended to explore the world of black magic and the supernatural. It is reported that the program recruited fortune tellers, palm readers, clairvoyants, astrologists, mediums, psychics, specialists in demonology, and other occult practitioners to attempt to harness demonic powers as tools of espionage. In the book, see, this is this is another, I have to mention this, like, because we, we talked about this in the beginning of the previous episode about, like, the person who thinks they're saving the world the things they're willing to do, mm -hmm. right? So here you go. You have these people who are in the government and they're in the intelligence and they think they're trying to save the free world and look what they're willing to do, right? Right? Sure, call up those demons, yep. you know? We'll deal with them. Got to save the world. <laughs> <laughs> in the book Monarch, the new Phoenix program, author Marshall Thomas states... <clears throat> Dr. Stephen Aldrich took control of M M.K. Often, an investigation into the occult with the help of Houston sorceress Sybil Leake. CIA behaviorists carefully studied every aspect of the occult underground. The Scientific Engineering Institute, SEI, was a CIA cutout that had been set up in 1956 to study radar. In 1972, SEI also sponsored a course at the University of South Carolina in rituals in demonology and voodoo. Dr. Aldrich was an MK Ultra programmer who focused on remote brain manipulation and the occult, the twin threads that run through the SEI Corporation. <clears throat> the aforementioned Sybil Leake was a self professed sorceress, astrologer, psychic, and author of more than 60 books, who was dubbed Britain's most famous witch by the BBC. <laughs> this is now ringing a bell. Yeah. Leake was a family friend of Alistair. Did she ever get interviewed by a. Uh, um, coast to coast, the original coast to coast guy. Possibly. I think, listen to this. I think so. Leek was a family friend of Aleister Crowley, who was a regular visitor to her family home, and who used to pass the time by reading his poetry to the young Sybil. She first met the great beast when she was only nine, and it was Crowley who actively encouraged her to begin writing. <clears throat> Man, that dude's everywhere, isn't he? Yep. Crowley's all now over he's, this. Now he's influencing the CIA. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> in 1972, Leak reportedly channeled a demonic entity named Caxulium, Caxulicum, who mocked NK often researchers present and bragged maniacally about how the world was being fooled into believing that aliens were among us, when in reality the forces of the Prince of Darkness himself we're preparing for the final confrontation with the powers of good. <laughs> Furthermore, Kex Ulicum informed, informed those present that Earth was a farm and nothing else. And energy derived from the souls of the human race and every living creature on the planet was being harvested to feed the minions of Satan. Nick Redfern was referred by Richard Duke to another Collins elite member who went by the name of Robert Manners. In 2007, Redfern met with Manners, who corroborated Duke's allegations and told him of a story that could have been pulled straight out of a sci-fi horror film. In 1970, MK Often personnel met with the Collins elite to discuss information obtained from a gentleman named Paul Garrett. According to Manners, Garrett was involved in an automobile accident on a highway outside of San Francisco, which plunged him into a strange near-death experience. While in that state, Garrett encountered a never-ending light blue landscape that was dominated by a writhing mass of an untold number of naked human beings screaming in agony. Above them, he saw a purple sky filled with hundreds of flying saucer-like objects that pulsed and throbbed, almost as if they were living, breathing entities in their own right. The objects busily raced back and forth across the sky like metallic worker bees. Garrett told doctors, small balls of light seemed to fly from the bodies of the people and were then sucked up into the flying saucers. At that point, an eerie and deafening silence overcame the huge mass of people who rose to their feet and collectively stumbled and shuffled across the barren landscape towards a large black hole that had now materialized in the distance. Interestingly, Garrett felt that while he was in his NDE state, he had seen things he shouldn't have and that they had followed him back. Hitchhikers. Uh, yes. 
Based on these stories and other information, some members of the Colin elite were for- Colin's elite were forced to face the horrific conclusion that the human race was being harvested for the digestion of human souls. While researching his book Final Events, Nick Redfern interviewed over a dozen former members of the Collins elite, and he summarizes their view like this. Those intruders assure us they are our friends and, friends and allies, but according to the Collins elite, they most certainly are not. They claim to have our best interests at heart, but in reality, says the group, the exact opposite is the case. And above all else, they earnestly want us to embrace the idea that they are extraterrestrial visitors from faraway star systems. For the Collins elite, that is the biggest, blackest, and boldest boldest deception of all. In an interview with Colonel John Alexander conducted by Project Unity in 2021, Alexander spoke of resistance he faced at high levels in the Pentagon from those who believed that UFOs were the work of the devil. He recalls once having been asked to make a UFO presentation, where at one point a very high-level official at the Pentagon, who was the deputy director for research and engineering, jumped up out of his seat, slamming his hands down on the desk and yelling, You're not supposed to know that! That's what you learn when you die. Wow. (laughs) In the documentary Third Eye Spies... Senior division analyst for neurosciences at the CIA involved with the SRI remote viewing project states that he was told by a government official, you are working with people who are linked with the devil and you are part of the Antichrist movement. In that same documentary, remote viewer number one for the Stargate project, Joe McGonigal states, I had a senior senator in camera stand up and say, you, sir, are doing the work of the devil and you will burn in the fires of hell and walk out. That's a senior lawmaker. And in the same meeting, when we broke for coffee, I had another senior lawmaker hug me and whisper in my ear, you're doing God's work, son. Now, which one scares you the worst? I remember that quote. Yeah. Uh, I don't know which one scares me the worst. (laughs) What do you think? (laughs) Again, it would appear there are two different factions, at least two different factions, even within the government itself. Yeah. Let me point out, and because this is a subtle thing that was mentioned earlier, and I don't know that that the listeners might have caught on to this, but what the two physicists that met with Ray Boucher said, their opinion or the opinion of the Collins elite was that because we're talking people that were involved in the Stargate project, right? Yeah, These two SRI. remote vi- right, uh, remote viewers, right? Okay. They claimed that that was a deception. Yeah, that the entities from the, themselves the entities were, were the ones that were giving them making it work. Right, exactly. Yeah. That it was not they were they did not actually perform or see like a remote viewer was not actually seeing these remote locations. The, yeah, the entities were projecting that, and that is a that is a that is in the Christian doctor at least with Catholics like divination is not you don't do it because it doesn't it's never you. Right, the, the doctrine basically says that if you're trying to do divination, you're basically calling upon demonic forces to help you see things you shouldn't be able to see. Whereas remote viewing, the idea is, is like, well, everybody can do this. And the Christian doctrine is saying, well, no, you're just you're you're not doing it, but the data is being given to you. Right. Yeah, yeah. The problem I have with the soul harvesting thing is just like, you know, think about it like any other farm. <laughs> you want to make the most of that plant that you can get so that your harvest is bigger. So what is the purpose of, you know, wh- why wouldn't we be given technology that would allow us to expand off the planet and go colonize other planets and all this stuff, again, from beings that are beyond our realm and that have some special knowledge. Yeah, of, they could they could soul harvest us if we took over the entire yeah, galaxy. Yeah, we could take over the whole universe and we'd be the biggest farm ever. <laughs> but no, keep them down, keep them on the planet. That's mm-hmm. that's again this suggests to me, nope. This is I not I know this that's not happening on other planets. Yeah, they may be soul harvesting other beings. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. It did Nobody, say that, doesn't it, look like there's a bunch of people on Mars. <laughs> Maybe there was. Give us the technology to... T- oh, well, you screwed up that farm. Yeah, that's right. You They're killed just that rotating farm. crops. Yeah. Give us the technology to terraform. Yeah. 
And we'll inhabit the entire solar system for your farm. Yeah. It just doesn't make Maybe sense. Maybe we're working sorry. towards that. Again, yeah. we this the long game. They've we had what the long they've game had is. hundreds of thousands of years to make that Maybe happen. They've been doing this for millions or billions of years. We don't know. Well, there's shitty farmers. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Get a new job. <laughs> Okay, so in pre just closing this, this section here. In previous episodes, we have repeatedly mentioned that George Knapp, Robert Bigelow, and Lou Elizondo have all referenced a highly placed group they refer to as Christian fundamentalists within the Pentagon that claimed that UFOs were demonic and forced the cancellation of the ATIP program. And we now know that the reasons behind that belief were held by a shadowy group known as the Collins Elite. Yeah, I remember Redfern. I think I heard him on Mysterious Universe talking about the Collins Elite. He did an interview with them right after publishing that book. It was really interesting. Yeah. I couldn't tell if, you know, and this is classic with Redfern. I couldn't tell if he bought it. He does, from, from, I've listened to a lot of I interviews. I think that he interview. felt like those guys were believable. He thinks it's, he, he, he doesn't. He's not 100% on board. He yeah. thinks it could be an op. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't dispute that. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just it's part. It's just another puzzle piece. Right. It is suspicious how it happens, right? He calls up. He's like, yeah, I'm kind of looking for, you know, some people who used to work in the government that thought UFOs were demons. And they're like, whatever. And then a couple of days later, he gets a call, and they're like, "Yeah, you wanted to talk about uh, well, demons and UFOs." He, like some some CIA guy is like, "Oh yeah, I'll take that phone call." He does. I'll I'll uh, put that out uh, there. This will be great. I can't remember the name. <laughs> the 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 first the first interview that he conducted, the eighty six year old member senior yeah. member of the Collins Duke, Elite, Mr. Duke. Mr. He says that Duke. He said, and he goes, "I don't want to, you know, disparage elderly people or anything." He goes, but he. From the time he was contacted to the time, or, or should it even back up further, from the, it was only 11 days from when he called, Yeah, from when he, when he received the call to when he met with him. And he said, they met for hours, and he said that he was as sharp as a tack. That yeah. He said, everything he asked him, he had an immediate answer, and he goes, I would find it very hard to believe that someone of his age could have memorized that much information and been that quick with his responses. Mm. He said, in his opinion, he was being truthful. Yeah. That doesn't mean that the information that he had wasn't, that what it was factual. In other words, again, he's relaying <sighs> Yeah. Information but that's classic that Nick Redfern. I've, I've read tons of his articles and quite a few of his books, and he's like, he, he does a good reporter's job of like, here's the data that I got. Right, he's, he's doing not, what I'm doing. Yeah, he's, just, he's not trying to tell you yeah. what to think. He's just saying, "Here's the data. Make of it what you will." Yeah, he lives in Austin. We ought to get him on the show. You, that you would know. be yeah. interesting. Yeah, that would be cool. And we are way over again. Way over time. Yeah, let's take already, a break. We've already Holy we're already cow. on two hours. Yeah. So. Okay. Well. All right. We'll be right back. Yeah. back ladies and gentlemen i think this is the final segment <laughs> and it will go as long as it needs to go yeah uh brothers of the servant the way you wish ufology was taught <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah marty you could send us whole shows like this i could just read them yeah <laughs> you don't even have to be here <laughs> i'm a lot better writer than speaker this is a great this is great stuff okay so if you've been cl paying close attention, you may have noticed that certain organizations and individuals seem to continually spring up in our disparate discussions. And one of these is the infamous Stanford Research Institute, otherwise known as SRI International. Organized in 1946, the Stanford Research Institute was created to advance scientific knowledge and to benefit the public at large, not just the students of Stanford University. But by the following year, 
The institute was already under contract by the Office of Naval Research. By the 1960s, SRI was involved in the development of, compu of the computer mouse, optical disc recording, liquid crystal displays, inkjet printing, and in 1966 opened their Artificial Intelligence Center, and in 1969 was involved in the development of ARPANET, the proto-internet, and in 1977 performed the first transmission over the internet. All the while, SRI was steeped in DARPA, or Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency projects, for the Department of Defense. But unquestionably, SRI's most infamous projects began in 1972 when physicists Harold E. Putoff, Putoff? Putoff. Putoff and Russell Targ undertook a series of investigations of psychic phenomena entitled Project Stargate, sponsored by the CIA. These projects included consciousness research with psychics such as Yuri Geller and remote viewing with Pat Price, Ingo Swan, and Joseph McGonigal. Hal Putoff served as an officer in the Navy from 1960 to 63 at Fort Meade, which was followed by a position with the NSA. To that point, Putoff had a stellar career in electromagnetic engineering and laser physics and even received a patent for a tunable laser in 1970. Then, inexplicably, he made a radical shift to biofield measurement and parapsychology. According to Robin Adair's Remote Viewing, A Brief History, Putoff's career shift coincided with, this, with his achievement of OT... What is this? Seven. OT7? The highest level within Scientology, which provided him access to all of their classified data. God. Yes. Hal Putoff was <sighs> a high-level Scientologist. <laughs> okay. Adair states, In January 1971, NSA's Harold Hal Putoff, one of the fewer than 3,000 Scientology clears in the world in 1971, has joined the ranks of a much smaller number of OT7s. So he's one of the clears. Following initiate scanate or scan by coordinate research funded by the CIA in 1970, Putoff and Targ began conducting their remote viewing research at SRI with another OT7 Scientologist, Ingo Swan. The Scientology publication Creation of Human Ability, published in 1954, known as the Grand Tour, states, The commands of the Grand Tour are as follows. Be near Earth, be near the Moon, be near the Sun, Earth, Moon, Sun, giving the last three commands many times. Each time the auditor must wait until the pre-clear signifies that he has completed the command. The pre-clear is supposed to move near these bodies or simply be near them. It does not matter which. Ritual. Yeah. Like a remote viewing ritual. Exactly. <clears throat> In an addendum to Parapsychology and Intelligence, A Personal Review and Conclusions, former CIA officer Kenneth Kress asserts that SRI remote viewer and OT7 Scientologist Pat Price was a mole relaying detailed records of CIA intelligence ob ob objectives to the Church of Scientology. Price left SRI in the fall of 1974 and died under suspicious circumstances in a Las Vegas hotel room in 1975, which is a major focus of the documentary Third Eye Spies, mentioned previously. I remember that. Yeah. On July 8th, 1977, the FBI launched simultaneous early morning raids on three Church of Scientology offices in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. The raids resulted in the conviction and imprisonment of 11 Scientology of officials, including Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue. Hubbard himself was one of nearly 40 named unindicted co-conspirators. The conspiracy charges including breaking and entering, burglary, bugging, theft of tens of thousands of pages of government documents, forging government credentials, forging evidence, de destroying evidence, coaching a witness to lie under oath, and kidnapping. SRI's paranormal research continued with funding from the U.S. intelligence community until Putoff and Targ left in the mid-1980s. In 1985, Putoff founded EarthTech International in Austin, Texas, employing Dr. Eric Davis, and in 2017 co-founded To the Stars Academy with Tom DeLong and former CIA senior intelligence officer Jim... How do you say that? Simavan. Simavan. Yeah, to the, the TTSA. <laughs> this is insane. Yeah, the connections are just mind-blowing. Yeah. 
All right. Um, okay. So the central character of Dr. Diana Paul, uh, Pasolka, is that right? Pasolka, yeah. Dr. Diana Pasolka's book, American Cosmic, is a mysterious individual who she refers to as Tyler D. So Marty says he spent time researching this individual and was able to verify his identity. However, he was recently doxxed by someone else we will be discussing later, so I believe we can now use his real name, Timothy E. Taylor. I do feel confident saying yes, he is a real person with all the credentials P Pasolka claims, and then some. Taylor is a very wealthy entrepreneur who's worked with NASA and various intelligence agencies and authored a book titled Launch Fever, an entrepreneur's journey into the secrets of launching rockets. For those of you who have not read American Cosmic, spoiler alert, much of Taylor's wealth was derived from his 40-plus patents, like Andre Puharik, for medical implants, devices, and procedures, including probes. <laughs> he also holds other interesting patents in seemingly unrelated areas as well, such as UAV guidance and communication, and one curiously titled Data Collaboration Between Different Entities. Wow, that's a weird. I messaged patent. Tony about that. We were trying to, uh, I was trying to get his opinion on mm. what the patent is, is about. Trying to, is trying to, to cover because uh. they were so vaguely written, they kind of don't want you to really understand what yeah. they're about. The kicker is those who have read the book know is that Taylor claims that at least some of these patents resulted from information he obtained through downloads from non-human intelligence. In an earlier paper, Pasolka wrote, Tyler's most successful technologies, such as implant devices that are etched with a laser and coded so that human tissue recognizes them as itself and not a foreign agent, or the use of an ancient stem cell that appears to help alleviate pain associated with cancer, is not something he openly shares. Why? Because, he explained to me, the implants were inspired by non-human intelligence. In other words, it wasn't his own brilliant idea, nor was it another human's. He believes that it came from a supernatural source, perhaps extraterrestrial. Why are extraterrestrials supernatural? Or is that just a weirdly written sentence? That's actually something that... Uh, um, what's... Uh, boy, I'm drew a blank on the name um edgar mitchell uh, edgar oh, yeah. mitchell argued he says on the contrary it is natural yeah yeah if it's happening it's part of the natural yeah. realm right mm -hmm. <laughs> so he never tyler never told any of the scientists he recruited to his team where he acquired the idea for the new technology because according to him first they would have thought i was really weird and second, most importantly, it would have prevented them from being successful in implementing the necessary steps to create the technology. It would have been so far removed from their own belief systems that it would have been impossible for them to implement my vision. So I kept that part secret. In American Cosmic, Taylor takes Pasolka out to a purported UFO crash site in a secret location. Is this the person she refers to as? Tyler D. The Invisibles. Yes, the Invisibles. The scenes. Invisibles. Mm -hmm. That's who. That's the word I was looking yep. for. Yep. Yeah. Uh, a secret location in the New Mexican desert, not Roswell, which he refers to as the gifting field. Taylor goes on to express his belief that this, as well as many other similar sites around the world, were not crash sites at all, but were instead gifts from the non-human intelligence to seed advancements in human technology. In a more recent interview... Pasolka added an interesting comment regarding debris recovered at such sites. Taylor told her, you think you are studying the parts, but the parts are studying you. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So is she talking about the site that, uh, that is in Trinity? I don't Trinity? know if it's at Trinity site or not. Okay. She makes, in the book, she makes an interesting comment that when she was there, that it looked familiar, and, Ty and Tyler asked her, he says, you recognize this place? Yeah. And and she and he she says, yeah, for some reason, yeah. yes. And uh, apparently, and this is on a, I guess, government property or something, It's but apparently the last episode of The X-Files was filmed there. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> That makes sense. On that site, yeah, strange. 
But it also makes sense, like when you, you know, if you were going to do a, an experiment with like rats or something, you give them some puzzle yeah. to figure out and they think they're figuring out the puzzle and yeah. really. Yeah, they're like, I'm going to solve this puzzle yeah. and back engineer this technology well, and make my own puzzles. We're solving <laughs> the puzzle of them right. by giving them this puzzle to solve. Yeah. Exactly. But again, it's uh, go back to, to the watchers and, you, you know, Enoch saying that the fallen angels gave yeah. mankind technology. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So Robert Matters of the Collins Elite provided Nick Redfern with extracts from a 367-page report titled The Collins Report, Deception and UFOs, What We Believe and Why, published in 1998. The report references several books and documents and makes this curious statement. This writer assumes critical, independent, and prior readings of, the Col of Collins' elite of Parsons, Von Karman, and Goddard, A Door Unlocked, Cub Elite, Defense Intelligence Agency, 1971, and New Mexico Origins, Parsons, Hubbard, and Babylon Working, Monroe, Formula, Collins Elite, 1988. So are these referencing papers that these Their people books, have written? Books. books. Okay. The Babylon pa Working. Parsons, books. Hubbard, and the Babylon Working. Internal, uh, internal book. Wow. Okay. All attempts to obtain copies of these documents have thus far been unsuccessful, but their titles offer more than a few clues about the Colin Elite, Collins elite's feelings about these individuals' connections to the Roswell incident. Why do they, by the way, why do they call them that? Why is their the name? Collins Elite. It was started off because originally the group was just some of the analysts getting together informally. Yeah. And one of the one of the people on the panel was from. Uh, town i believe in oh, i think it was in pennsylvania and there was a small town and the only thing it had like a high number of of cheese factories or something okay. <laughs> and this and it was the city of collins and so coming from the one of the cheese families or something it was kind of an inside joke okay it's an inside the, joke the collins elite so yeah it's not really significant it doesn't signify anything okay so, in that regard, the report, let's see, the, yeah, the report states, Stack 5, what's that? S-T-A-C-5? Uh, must be a, a, a project or an agency, you yeah. know, a, a group. So, Stack 5 also informs that WPAFB, Wright-Patterson Air, Wright Wright Air Force Base, Wright-Patterson Air Force sources have had some success using the Parsons Technique in achieving spontaneous, brief laboratory manifestation of materials very similar to two of those that fell in Lincoln County, New Mexico, in 1947. What did that just say? Yeah. Well, I mean, is that like making isotopes of specific? You know what I'm saying? Like, if you if you get if you make an unstable isotope of some material or some, um. I can't think of the word element. It like briefly manifests. Yeah. Right. But then it breaks down. Using the Parsons. Yeah, using Jack Parsons technique for manifestation manifesting stuff. So it sounds like they're talking about using a ritual. Yeah. His to cause materials to manifest that are similar to stuff associated with a crash. Wasn't he also a, a scientist? Yeah. He was a chemist and a, yeah. He was, I mean, he probably had informal. I mean, he didn't have a degree or anything. Right. But, so, yes, uh, you're right. The Parsons technique could be some kind some of chemical, chemical process. process. Yeah. Just do my but job it, over but here. In the, in the context of the rest of this, <laughs> I I, know, I'm I know. not sure that's what it's talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In 1991. Ray Bachet was also told by the two physicists from the Collins elite that the unusual debris found in 1947 was not the result of a crash or aerial explosion of an alien spacecraft. Rather, that may have been cosmically and alchemically weaved in realms far away and then carefully and deliberately dropped on the desert floor at the Foster Ranch. Bochet asked them specifically later in a later conversation, how do you know this? And how does it happen that a demonic force can also interact physically? And their response was, you're a pastor. You've studied theology. Go back to the Bible and look. <laughs> 
Boucher remarked, One of the things that made me believe there could be some sort of physical interaction is the mention of the Nephilim in Genesis in the Bible. Whatever these otherworldly beings were, angels or fallen angels, they were able to interact physically and create some sort of progeny here on Earth. Just as the nature of the unidentified objects observed in the sky has changed to suit the level of sophistication of the historical period, it is also possible that so has the nature of the materials recovered. The conclusion that the UFO crash debris in the 20th century were gifts from extraterrestrials is not inconsistent with the treasures found by money diggers such as Joseph Smith under the direction mm -hmm. of spirits in the 19th century. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. good right there. Yeah. That was my... My connection. Yeah. I didn't, well, didn't read that anywhere. I yeah, that's good. Where's my... And, and it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> Boom. That's what I hit. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you know, and this this idea of the, of the crashes being intentional or being gifts is is driven largely in by the fact that there has allegedly been so many. Like, what are the odds that these things are coming from, you know, distant, yeah, you know, distant planets or something, and then all of a sudden they get here and they're crashing left and right? What, there was seven of them in, in New Mexico alone in the mid-40s? You know, it seems like there's something else going on. Now, granted, I would venture to bet that a large percentage of them were some form of government testing of yeah. military you know, hardware aircraft or something. Yeah. But if again, we're, I mean, we're, there's a lot of assumptions in this, but if there's any validity to that, it would seem that they're not crashes or something else. So we have hardware and we have software. What is this stuff? Spirit wear? Something in between. <laughs> Again, Firmware. going back Firmware. to going Firmament back to <laughs> going back to my analogy at the beginning, because that's sort of what I was trying to cover. Is uh, instead, I mean, it just seems practical. If you're, and we may eventually get this way. Like you, you, we may, maybe within our lifetime, that you, when when you go on Amazon and you order something, instead of having it shipped halfway across the world, you have your yeah, it just gets tricky, printed. Trick, trick, you know, tricked out new 3D printer, and yeah. it just transmits the blueprints effectively of whatever this thing is, and it just spits it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's already happening. I mean, yeah, Stevenson, yeah. Stevenson that's had a great. They, they do that with the space station. Yeah, I mean, they, they design parts, parts and then just right send the e data. So where do you think that technology will be a hundred years from now? Much less a thousand or more. Yeah, Stevenson had this idea in a book he wrote called The Diamond Age that there was this thing called the feed. And it was actually like everybody was hooked up to it in the same way that we're all hooked up to power lines, except this thing sent um, elemental materials. Again, over. So, you like, could... you just had a. You had the feed connected to your house, and then you had the printer, and you just made anything you wanted. It would just draw the materials out of the feed. And as I pointed out in, uh, I, was it the Skinwalker episode, I believe, I mentioned that, that, 3D, that 3D printing technology is so old that the patent's already expired. Yeah, that's right. That's the only reason that we're seeing it at a consumer level now, is that it's so old, whatever agencies are in that initially developed it, they're done with it, or they've moved on. They've yeah. moved to more sophisticated technologies. Or So, again, if you can... If you can if we can conceive of ways of this being accomplished, minds far more advanced than ours will eventually figure it out and, and develop it. Yeah. All right. Final document here. Although the Collins Elite assessment painted a very negative picture of contact with non-human intelligence, as we heard in the story, such as that of Jack Prager's Paraclete... Paraclete and AB's life-saving otherworldly medical diagnosis, not all contacts with these mysterious forces has proven to be demonic. As a PhD professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington, in her book American Cosmic, Diana Walsh Pasolka applies her expertise in theology to analyze historical events such that which took place at Fatima in Portugal 
1917, and other Marian apparitions through the lens of potential UFO encounters. Although not elaborated upon in the book, Pasolka was introduced to Tyler D., a.k.a. Timothy Taylor, by a quiet gentleman from Fayetteville, North Carolina, with a very bizarre story that happened to be the subject of ATIP's first investigation. This is a question, if we're able ever yeah. able to get Louis Elizondo on, that's, that's the first question I would ask him. Yeah. What do you know about this encounter? Because I've never heard him answer anything related mm. to this. And it's very strange. And if, initially known as the Fayetteville Encounter, this story spans nearly 15 years and it would easily fill a dedicated episode. So we'll just touch on the highlights, which we believe are most relevant to the theme we have been presenting. Chris Bledsoe owned a very successful construction company that built over 100 homes per year with 15 to $18 million in gross annual sales. Then in the early 2000s, he developed severe Crohn's disease to the point that in 2004, he was hospitalized and had a near-death experience. As a result of this condition, Blesdo was bedridden for two years and his wife's wife was forced to sell the business. Once doctors were able to stabilize his condition with medication, he was still suffering from severe depression. Finally, in October of 2006, he started contracting again. And upon completion of his first home in January 2007, he was sent on an incredible journey that continues to this day. <clears throat> As stated, his first encounter took place during a fishing trip on January 8, 2007. At approximately 5.15 in the afternoon, he encountered three objects he described as 40 to 50 foot diameter rotating balls of liquid fire, which resulted in nearly five hours of missing time. One evening, not long after that first incident, Blesdo is at home when the dogs in his kennel begin barking. He looks out the window and he sees a light and believes someone is breaking into his father's workshop. So he runs out and is confronted by a four-foot-tall expressionless being which he describes as glassy and glowing brightly like the color of the moon with a dark triangle on its chest. Then suddenly he hears loudly in his head, You don't understand. We're not here to harm you. We're here to help you and it vanished. Then, a few minutes later, he's smoking a cigarette and trying to reconcile what he just witnessed when he is approached by an eight-foot-tall being with, lar with a large head and eyes. Blesdo immediately turns and grabs his son, Chris Jr., and runs to his truck and speeds away. Although terrifying, following these encounters, all of his Crohn's symptoms vanish. However, in spite of that, he still suffered negative repercussions. Blesdo hesitantly, hesitantly contacted Bledsoe. MUFON, huh? Bledsoe. Bledsoe, yeah. sorry. Bledsoe hesitantly contacted MUFON in order to report the incident, and a large investigation ensued. Eventually, James Carrion, a regional director of MUFON. <laughs> hmm? I'm whispering something oh. to myself. <laughs> you know this guy? Uh, yeah, have you watched the, the uh, Showtime UFO mm -hmm. documentary by... Uh, What's his name? Bad Robot. Um, oh, I'm so... My brain's scattered right now. Yeah, Dr. no, yeah. I haven't watched it. He comes out in it. Okay. He's a, I don't know how uh, someone of that nature would... Become a regional be a, director? Or even be involved. Hmm. He's a skirptard. Oh. Uh, well, they probably have to have a few skirptards just to point and be able to say, look, we got some skirptards, you know? got to have a script heart or two so that you appear like you're legit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this guy, this regional director, pushes Bledsoe to participate in a Discovery Channel documentary. And this turns out to be a hit job, and Bledsoe is depicted as a fool. As a result, his children are ridiculed in school, and even his family does not believe him. He's also shunned by his community, and all of this causes him to avoid any further involvement with the UFO community. Yeah, that's bad. Then in 2008, NASA astronomer and engineer Dr. Hal Povenmire, Povenmire, yeah. Povenmire shows up on, on Bledsoe's doorstep and is taken under his wing for the 11 years which, is, which followed. Dr. Povenmire became Bledsoe's biggest supporter along with CIA senior intelligence offer, officer Jim Semivan, who took up the position of Bledsoe's protector, as well as Colonel John Alexander and former Stargate Project remote viewer Joe McGonagall. Bledsoe believes that he was ostracized by MUFON and a large segment of the ufological community because he believed that his encounters involved angels and not scary extraterrestrials. 
Furthermore, he believes the glowing four-foot-tall entities were some form of artificial technology. He also emphasizes that he has been told by members of three-letter government agencies that there is a great deal of significance to the dark triangle on their chest and its connections to Giza and the back of the dollar bill, which has a connection to Henry Wallace and the Nine. Through a regression performed by Dr. Michael O'Connell, Bledsoe recovered the memory of the nearly five hours of missing time and recalled that he was taken on board one of the craft by the eight-foot-tall, large-headed beings. But the single most profound encounter was yet to come. In 2012, Bledsoe was asleep when, at 3 a.m., he hears a loud, deep voice say, Arise. And he sits up and looks around and sees some type of shadowy figures against one of the walls. He gets up and gets dressed, and inexplicably, he finds himself following these three of the shadowy figures out. When they reach the area where he had first encountered the beings before, the shadow beings turn around, and under their cloaks are the same four-foot glowing beings he encountered before, and one of them hands him an object. When he reached out to take the object, it was described as a feeling like a limbless, furry animal, roughly the shape of a sausage. When he felt it, he was startled and instinctively dropped it, and one of the beings then said to him, This is yours. You must keep. Bledsoe then bent down to pick it up, and as he stood back up, he saw a massive bull charging at him. He raised his arms to protect his face as he fell backwards. In the split second, as the bull crossed over him, he could see stars through its body. When Bledsoe jumped back up to run away, standing before him was a vision. Floating a few feet off the ground was what he calls the Lady, who he describes as stunningly beautiful with long golden hair, dressed in a gown covered in stars. The Lady told him, You have suffered much. You know why I am here. This is your burden. You must keep. Two weeks later, Bledsoe meets Diana Pasolka but upon their initial meeting, she does not speak with him directly. Her husband performs the interview. Then in June, Diana requests to meet with him during a conference. In the evening of the conference, they step away from the group and speak for the first time, and she relays to him the details of the recent experience that led, her, led to her contacting him, which to my knowledge remains undisclosed. Okay, so we don't know why. No, apparently okay. <clears throat> she's never mentioned it, but apparently she has had some form of experience uh, as well. okay. And she's an academic. She's so like, she's I'm here for the furry sausage. <laughs> <laughs> she later requested that he fly out to Hollywood to meet with the directors of the movie The Conjuring, upon which she was consulting. Due to his prior experience, he declined, but she persisted until he stated that he would need to... S Sign uh, that he would need us to sign an agreement to do so against his in inclination. Hmm. That sign. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry. He needs a sign in order to agree to do so. And that sign came inexplicably in the form of a tree burning from the inside in the middle of his front yard, which was nearly inextinguishable. So now he's got the burning bush. Once he agrees, he was harassed by an unnamed but allegedly well-known government agent warning him not to attend the meeting with the movie producers. Upon notifying his friend, Jim Simivan, he was told not to worry and proceed with the meeting. Pasolka corrobor corroborates that. So you think that was one of the Collins people? One of the Collins people is like mm. telling him, don't do this? I don't know. You're about to go That I don't meet know. up with these movie people doing The Conjuring, and that was about the, um, what's the name of those, that couple? Famous paranormal investigators kind of I got discredited remember. later. Yeah, I don't remember the name. But yeah. I, Diana Pasolka was a con consultant on that. Right, I find that interesting. I mm -hmm. thought The Conjuring was pretty good. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, what's the name of that? Anyway. <clears throat> okay, so Pasolka corroborates that during the meeting at a restaurant in Hollywood, she stepped outside and parked up, f and parked up front was a large governmental vehicle with agents standing around, one of which gave her a nod. <laughs> Bledsoe has turned down several offers for the rights to his story. Grant Cameron corroborates this, claiming he that he personally witnessed an astonishingly large offer from Tom DeLonge. Bledsoe has declined these offers on the basis of retention of ultimate rights of approval of the script to dissuade sensationalism and accure, ensure the accuracy of the account. Maybe, just maybe, as with Joseph Smith and Ray Hernandez, 
He was prohibited from deriving monetary gain from his experience. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> Although downplayed by Bledsoe, Cameron also claims to have witnessed Bledsoe's apparent healing powers. <clears throat> And another inexplicable experience is documented in the book Reality Denied by Colonel John Alexander. In short, while visiting him at his home in North Carolina, they are sitting in Bledsoe's truck discussing the phenomenon when in the middle of the conversation, Bledsoe tells him, they're here. Alexander looks up and sees a large white orb hovering in the sky over the truck, which then shoots off at incredible speed. The lady continues to visit Bledsoe and has conveyed to him many messages, the details of which have only been shared with the related parties. One of these is said to have been an assassination attempt on the Pope, which caused a change in itinerary and thwarted. As such, Bledsoe has drawn the attention of the Vatican, where some of his writings reside in their archive, as he is being monitored by their staff. Furthermore, after one of their initial meetings, Timothy Taylor sent Bledsoe a picture of an envelope and a drink coaster from Camp David, suggesting that Taylor was briefing then-President Obama on their meeting. It is an incredible story, yet relatively little is known of the full story. There is one especially important detail that has been recently disclosed. This is the true name of the lady, which should have been quite a bit of which should have quite a bit of significance to the overall theme of this long presentation. The lady's name is Hathor. Yeah, <laughs> of course. There is so much to unpack in all of this. We could probably spend an entire episode just doing just so. And I suspect we will probably be doing so in a Patreon segment at some point. <laughs> not, not today. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this long and twisty road through what, as I was re researching it, I came to refer to as The Great History of Unlikely Coincidences. <laughs> That's a fantastic book name. I hope I was able to relay, relay at least a certain degree of brain expansion and to have blown your mind at least once. Yes, oh, yeah. I say so. So, Marty says, allow me to conclude with this final quote by C.S. Lewis. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, the devils, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Wow. That's good. <laughs> bam, materialists and magicians, but bam. <laughs> and a bonus quote. The day science begins to study non-physical phenomena... It will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of his existence. Nikola Tesla. Wow. <laughs> yeah, there's another guy who was traveling across universes. <laughs> That's to right. Yeah, stuff. that dude was definitely receiving visions. <laughs> Man. Bravo, my friend. Yeah, well done. Excellent stuff. I'm blown away by all of the connections to ancient Egypt. Yeah. And you, this should have particular importance to Kyle, the, that Hathor is represented by the bull. Oh, yeah. But notice that Crowley and the Nine both communicated with Nut, which is also depicted by a bull. Hmm. Don't know, man. <laughs> it seems strange that so many different parties over such a long expanse of time, we were talking 500 years at least, and just the more contemporary parts of this story, starting with, yeah, from let's D, say from D, D to now. Today, yeah. D was communicating with the same entities, some of the same entities that the Egyptians were, and all the way through now Chris Bledsoe is also. So, again, could be coincidence. There may be some underlying reason. Uh, I will, again, emphasize the fact that um, John Alexander and it was, and, and many of the other characters that we discussed were involved in projects at SRI with, you know, a large number of those people were Scientologists. And if you go back and re-listen to what 
Hubbard claims it was. He claims it's a technology. So I don't know what exactly that technology is, but it appears to have some connection to remote viewing. Yeah. And I don't know how that plays into this. I find it strange that so many of these characters have all of a sudden gravitated to Chris Bledsoe. I, I don't know, in other words, it could mean you, one interpretation is that it's an op again. Maybe it's some type of a psyop. Maybe it's some projection, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, a deception on the part of a, the government, maybe and a test. I don't know, something like that. Or is it that they know that there is something to it and he is the current chosen one to carry this knowledge or that's being presented this knowledge. He's yeah, like, it does, in, a, in a way, he's like the John D of today. Yeah, it does seem like in some limited cases, anyone can do some of this stuff. But the best thing probably if you're trying to really have a powerhouse is to just find someone who's already who's yes. already been put in contact or forced into it or is doing it on purpose or whatever. They you know? say that and I, I assume that that the remote viewing is a lot like like the psychic communication stuff that they say every, any, everybody's yeah, capable yeah. of it. Right, but, everybody's capable of it. But it's like basketball. Some people can play basketball and some people are extraordinarily yes, adept right. at it. So that that's you know, that's what uh, that's what happened to D. D D brushed up against this, but he did not have the ability to communicate. He yeah. had to find people that were especially talented in that. Yeah, to be able to exactly. Do. Yeah. And maybe that's, you know, in, right. Like, like in this, in the case of, of, uh, Chris Bledsoe, Tyler D's receiving, uh, you know, by his own claims and he's got the bank account to back it up yeah. that he's receiving downloads of information that have made him very wealthy. Yeah. And yet he's gravitated to Chris And Bledsoe. so in his case, he's allowed to make money off of the stuff he gets, right? It's like interesting because like in some cases they're like, you're not allowed to make he monetary. He made a deal with the devil. Yeah, though. I know. And, and they're, getting, he's like, they're like, here you go. And he's like, patent, patent. And he's like, all his guys. I've money. heard in an, in an interview, this is not something talked about very much, but I've heard in an interview with Ryan Bledsoe, which is Chris Bledsoe's son, that some of the patents that he has were derived from information he obtained through Chris Bledsoe mm. or were verified. Like he would bring him an idea that Chris Bledsoe allegedly would then ask the lady or whoever he's in communication with and they would correct it or alter it or yeah. verify it in some way. Casey was like that too. He, I was surprised I was going to add, hear Casey I was, in any of this. I, I was, was going to put, because Casey was doing the same, the like the, Casey was doing the medical diagnosis through the spirits refused, very much He like, refused to take money right, for right. his. I just, I had to draw a line somewhere. I can only put so much. Yeah. And if this thing becomes a book, there'll be a lot of other characters that I just didn't. Some of it, I also wanted to try to put in as much of the stuff maybe you hadn't heard of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Than things that are a little more. Now, you've talked about Casey in the past. Oh man, it's it was uh, it's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Definitely <laughs> a set of episodes I'm gonna have to listen to multiple times. Right. We'll chew on them and then we'll do some Patreon stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the time this, well, no, I won't. Be but it's possible it. that by the time this episode gets published, Kyle and I could do a Patreon episode on some of this content, even if you can't be there. I know you've got. You've got to travel, but you might be able to do it remotely with yeah. us. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean by remotely? Like, how are you going to just? He's just going to like summon sit some down. down and... <laughs> 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 He's going to draw the same pentagram thing you drew on the floor of the cube yeah. to summon Pan. <laughs> <laughs> and then there'll be two of them, and he can just be here in spirit. <laughs> 
I'll remote in, remote view in. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. thanks, Marty. I really appreciate it. You got any, either of you have no. anything left? Yeah. Any, anything more this, to say? This Made might some explain good flat cakes in that pan. <laughs> <laughs> this might explain my uh, absence from the Discord for the last few weeks. Oh yeah. Working on this and hadn't been communicating very much. Plus, I kept. I was trying to avoid it because I get questions that I didn't want to answer. <laughs> At least now I can actually yeah. talk about it a little well, bit. Well, wait. You, no, this, you, you got to wait for this episode to come out. Oh, yeah, I got to wait week. two weeks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> By the time they hear this, I'll already be able to do that. Yeah. All right, man. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. All right, everybody. Brothers of the Sermon at gmail.com for the email. Brothers of the Sermon.com for all the podcast stuff on the website. You can donate there. Uh, yeah, join the pyramid scheme. And thanks to all of you listeners. We're tired. We've been doing eight hours yeah. of podcasting now. So we're going to sign out. You know all the rest of the stuff. We love you guys. Always have. Always will. United Damu. Get back to work, Pan. <laughs> no! <laughs>